this meeting is not typically open to the public. Council and staff are meeting via Zoom, and there are several ways for the public to watch and participate. Information on how to join the meeting using Zoom or a landline or mobile phone, along with how to submit public comment during the meeting tonight, is available on our website, cityofcapitola.org, and on the published meeting agenda. The public can also live stream the meeting on our website or on our YouTube channel. As always, the meeting is cablecast live on Charter Communications Cable TV channel 8 and is being recorded to be rebroadcast on the following Wednesday at 8 a.m. and on Saturday following the first rebroadcast at 1 p.m. on Charter Channel 71 and Comcast Channel 25. Our technician this evening is Walter. Thank you so much, Walter, and thank you, Mayor Story. You wanted a uh, roll call? Yes, please. Okay. Council Member Bertrand. Present. Council Member Brooks. Okay. Council Member Brown. Okay. Vice Mayor Kaiser. Here. Thank you. And Mayor Story. Here. Thank you. And also, um, I understand that Councilmember Brown is um, in the process of logging on. And, um, okay, um, thank you. We'll, we'll acknowledge her presence um, you know, when uh, she arrives. Great. And uh, with that, now um, we'll have the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, I think I will go ahead and lead us. Um, with the pledge, and so everyone will prepare. Um, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. And I see that uh, Councilmember Brown is connected to audio. Well, yeah. Can you can you hear Councilmember Brown? I can. I'm just getting my camera set up. All right, she is here. Okay, Chloe, make note of that. Okay. I have her down. Um, Thank you. <laughs> yes. Uh, next, uh, the second item bring us additions and deletions to the agenda. The staff have any uh, uh, requested additions or deletions? We have no changes proposed to the agenda this evening. All right. Thank you. And uh, the council members have any requested additions or deletions to the agenda? Okay. Hearing none, um, I did want to, um, and, and this is not really an addition or a deletion, but I wanted to let the council members know that uh, uh, when, um, well, Council Member Brooks has um, uh, delayed this evening. Um, and uh, however, when she does arrive, um, which I we are informed that she'll be around 8 p.m., um, I was going to potentially move up the uh, item on the temporary outdoor dining program. Um, so, uh, because I think most of our attendees uh, are here for that item. Uh, but I will raise that once we know that Council Member Brooks is, is here. Um, so with that, uh, let's move on to uh, presentations this evening. And we have one presentation, which is to acknowledge the local government academy class of 2022. Is, this, is staff going to make this presentation or, or give us an intro? Sorry there, I was having a hard time unmuting my screen. So we completed the 2022 Local Government Academy just last month. Um, this is the, I think the sixth time that I've been able to participate in it. It's one of the really neat things that we get to do in Capitola. Every, every two years before an election cycle, we try to help citizens who may be interested in the community learn a little bit more about what the city does, uh, what we don't do, which is obviously important as well. 
and answer questions about how things are um, how things are run in our community. So this year we had about 25 participants in our local government academy, and we do, we held uh, four sessions. It was the first time we've done it virtually, uh, and it was also the highest participation we've ever had. So it was interesting to see how many folks were interested in doing it. We did do a survey. I haven't seen the results yet to try to get a feeling for whether or not the virtual option actually encouraged more participation. We ended up with presentations from all of our department heads, as well as uh, the leaders of our different divisions in the city. And then we had guest presentations from Soquel Creek Water District, Central Fire, uh, our library, and I'm blanking on one other. And one other presentation from an outside entity. Larry, if you hear me, you can. Was it the, the, uh, the water the district? district? Right, of course. It was our beloved superintendent, Scott Turnbull, superintendent of schools for our school district. So I know that we have a couple of attendees on today. I just want to personally thank them for their interest in the city. Uh, I encourage them to consider serving on boards and commissions in the future, potentially even running for office. That, I'm available to answer any questions the council. Um, any questions from council members? Any pop quiz to the uh, graduates? Uh, seeing none, um, um, I guess I wanted to as well as and my congratulations to all the uh, um, government and academy um, graduates of the class 2022. Um, it, it's impressive that this was um, the largest class that we ever had, um, and even though it was on Zoom, and they did it was because it was on Zoom um, that that came about. But I'm sure that going to the class gave everyone a better understanding of um, really the myriad of you know people and agencies and laws that really shape our local government. Um, and with this information, I think it will um, make make you a better citizen and really lays the foundation for you to be able to take that knowledge um, and make an impact in the community. So uh, congratulations for doing that. Um, and, um, um, and now you can you know, flip your tassel to the other side. So thank you. Um, and, and thank you staff for you know, taking the time and effort because it's a lot of work um, to put on that class and I think um, the, the, you know, the council appreciates it and the community appreciates the opportunity. So thank you. Um, with that, we'll move on to a report on the closed section from our city attorney. Good evening, Mayor and Council members. We had a closed session on the item on the agenda and we had direction given to staff. Thank you. Uh, do we have any additional materials this evening? Um, yes, uh, Mayor. Uh, yes, Mayor Story. The we did receive seven public comment emails, all regarding item nine E. That's the outdoor dining item. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, now we'll move on to item six, which is oral communications by members of the public. And this is on items that are not on tonight's agenda um, or are on the consent agenda. Um, so if you would um, like to make a comment, um, just, um, uh, raise your hand in the Zoom. Our moderator will uh, allow you to speak, or you can dial star nine on your phone. Um, also, you can send an email um, and to um, public comment, one word, at ci.epicola.ca.us. Um, and Larry, it looks like we have one Zoom attendee with their hand up. Yes, Mayor Story. Uh, we have Marley Morales. Yes. Go ahead, Ms. Morales. Thank you. Um, my name is Marley Morales. I am a program coordinator for Ventures, and Ventures works with working class 
of families in California's Central Coast to ensure a shared and equitable economic future for all. Our transformative programs include Semillitas, which creates an automatic college savings account for all newborns in Santa Cruz County, and Familias con Más, which provides financial capability efforts to help families build credit and savings. And recently, we released a Santa Cruz Like Me in partnership with Santa Cruz County, and the report recognized the value of representative government, including the importance of having diverse lived experiences in form and shape policy and governance. A Santa Cruz Like Me was a start to explore and identify how we are doing as a county. And we did this by doing a simple survey of county boards, commissions, and elected officials. I have sent the report to each of you via email, and we wanted to share the report and invite the city of Capitola to consider a similar effort. Ventures would also like to offer support to make it happen. If you have any questions or are interested in following up on this, please feel free to reply to that email. And thank you again for your time. Thank you, Ms. Morales, for um, informing us about uh, Ventures. Um, and um, Larry, do we have uh, any other um, attendees with their hands raised mayor story i do not see any attendees with their hands raised and we do not have any emails on this item okay and no phone calls okay. no we do not okay so that will uh conclude um the oral communications and so now let's move on to staff and city council um comments and we'll start with the staff I think our public works director has an announcement for us. Good evening, Mayor. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I'm very excited to tell you that we received word this week that we have received a grant from the 3CE organization for uh, our electric street sweeper. It's a $250,000 grant, and we will be placing the order. If it hadn't gone in today, it'll go in tomorrow. Unfortunately, there's a six to nine month uh, lead time to get the, the machine built, so it'll be a while before we see it. But we're excited to uh, receive the grant and move forward with the purchase of that equipment. That's excellent. Thank you, Steve. But, yeah. Um, any other staff comments? Seeing none, I'll ask the council if uh, they have any comments. Yeah, Council Member Brent. Thank you. I just wanted to share that this is our uh, last meeting in April, and so we're coming up into May. And May is both Community Action Month and Affordable Housing Month. And so in our first meeting in May, um, I'll have some exciting stuff to share with you about community action and the work of the Community Action Board. Uh, I believe that one of our program managers is going to come to another of our meetings in May for public comment and share some information. Um, about Community Action Month. And then for Affordable Housing Month, I know there's several events happening throughout the month of May, including uh, some put on by Housing Santa Cruz County, which is a, a great organization uh, that works to provide um, and support affordable housing in our, in our region. Um, so just something to keep in mind and to look out for is that in our coming meetings uh, in May, I will have some things to share about community action and affordable housing. Thank you, Council Member Brown. Uh, any other council members have comments this evening? Okay, going, going, gone. Seeing none, we'll um, then move on to our uh, consent calendar um, for this evening. Um, these items under consent, and there are three of them this evening um, that are posted on the agenda, um, will be um, taken with one vote unless the member of the council wishes to pull an item. Seeing none, um, I'll entertain a motion to approve the consent calendar. I'll move approval. I can second that. Okay. We have a motion by council member Brown and a second by vice mayor Kaiser uh, to approve the consent calendar. And we have a roll call vote, uh, Madam Clerk. Councilmember Bertrand. You're on mute, Councilmember Bertrand. You're still on mute. 
I approve. Thank you. Council Member Brown. Aye. Vice Mayor Kaiser. Aye. And Mayor Story. Aye. So the consent items passed unanimously um, by the council members who are present um, at the moment. Um, which will now bring us to item nine, which is the general government public hearing. Uh, the first item is to approve plan specifications and budget for the Clare Street traffic calming project. The recommended action is to approve those plan specifications and construction budget of 1,153,000 for the Clare Street traffic calming project and authorize the Department of Public Works to advertise for construction bids. Um, so you wanna lead us in this discussion, please? I'll start it off. Good evening again, Mayor and Council. Actually, uh, the presentation tonight is gonna be given by our project manager, Kailas Mazunder, who has been the lead on this project and uh, has uh, worked very hard in putting it together and gathering all the funding. So. With that, I'd like to hand it off to Kailash and ask him to give the presentation. Thank you, Steve. I'll, I'll start sharing my screen now. Larry, can you tell me if you guys can hear me okay? We can hear you great. All right, how, how do I look there? Screen looks good. Perfect, thank you. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council Members. The Public Works team is excited to bring this Clear Street Traffic Calming Improvement Project to you tonight. Uh, in this first slide, we show the limits of the project. This is a very dense residential area here. Um, the project limits start at the intersection at Claire's and 41st Avenue, and then all the way uh, east to the intersection at Wharf Road and Claire's. Uh, since this is such a residential area, we feel that all the enhancements we're bringing here will really enhance the community for the immediate residents and then those that use Claire's to get around town by foot, bicycle in, and through their cars. All right, so the next slide, we kind of walk through the project goals. Um, now, depending on how you use Claire's, you might rank these in different orders. So we're just going to say, you know, this isn't a priority ranking, but kind of just an overall, all the things that we're going to be able to bring to the community with this project. So the, the first one I wanted to highlight is the road condition. Um, this is a, you know, for those of you that use Claire's on, on road, on uh, by car or bicycle are probably familiar with the condition of the road. The pavement score is about 54 out of 100. So it's fairly low and um, has quite a few different issues with cracks, cracks and potholes and things of that nature that, that make it quite a, a challenge sometimes to navigate. So the project will re rehabilitate the entire roadway. So that should bring a, a nice smooth driving surface for both vehicles and pedestrians and cyclists. Uh, the second thing we'll be able to bring to the community here is enhancing for both pedestrians and bicycles. So. Um, by, by adding new crossings on, on Clare Street. Um, currently, the only places that you can cross Clare's are at the limits of the street. So at the far end at Wharf Road and the other end at 41st are the only two places that we have crosswalks. So we will be adding crosswalks. And I'll, I'll highlight that a little bit more in a, in a uh, following slide. Uh, one other component that we're bringing is bringing enhanced uh, safety and visibility at both intersections of Wharf and Claire's um, and uh, Claire's and 41st. Um, we'll, we'll go through the striping enhancements and the signage that's gonna be um, updated for those intersections that are aimed to bring more visibility to those using the intersection um, by foot and by bicycle. And then one of the things that we often think about with any of our projects is just the, the impacts to the immediate residents and community that uses the area. So, you know, if we were to do a concrete road, it would take a week to clear and people wouldn't be able to come in and out so we're looking at the different options for rehabilitation of the road uh, what we've done is selected uh, treatment which is cold in place recycling which we did a few years back on uh, monterey and park avenue and we were extremely pleased with that because it, it allowed the residents to get right back on the road uh, with almost you know no notice to having not being able to travel so 
it's a it's a really strong treatment and, and it also happens fairly rapidly and so the the turnaround time to be going from the existing condition to the brand new road is, is re fairly remarkable and i think when we, when we see it out there um it'll be you know short and sweet and then you know people will be back on the brand new road and and it should be should go fairly quickly there and then uh, we'll move on to the next slide and I wanted to acknowledge all the help and input that we got over the years on this project. So this um, started out years before I even started here at the city and has gone through quite a few rounds of public workshops. Most recently, we did workshops during, during the COVID, and so we did a virtual workshop. Um, it worked really well. We ended up with about 20 participants and got a lot of good input from the immediate community members there. Um, Often we have the, quite a few HOAs and they all had representatives that, that chimed in during those workshops and were able to provide kind of a collaborative voice for their, their immediate community, uh, speaking to the needs that they have and the challenges that they have. And it was very productive. It provided a little bit of input that, you know, I think we, we often, I often tell the residents that I, we really appreciate their input because though we're tasked with looking at the whole city, you know, they live at that particular corner every single day. And so getting that kind of insight is always very helpful for us. Um, and in addition to the, the workshop, we had an online survey, um, which was allowed those that weren't available to go to that workshop or attend the workshop to still provide their comments. And we had almost 80 uh, comments or participants that provided all their answers to that, that online survey that we did through SurveyMonkey, which was also, you know, kind of reiterated some of the the points that were brought up during the public workshop. Um, then in addition to our public outreach, we also worked with the Santa Cruz RTC Bicycle Advisory Committee, as well as the Elderly and Disabled Transportation Advisory Committee. Um, the, again, um, those two committees have you know, their unique perspective and provided insight into some of the options that we were looking at early on and gave us some in, in, insight. Uh, for example, we were looking at here and on the on the slide, you can see on the right-hand side, we had kind of mocked up a few different options for, for how a crossing could look at, a, at the intersection. And one of the things we were looking at was the difference between, say, a bulb out, which is the area on the bottom where the sidewalk gets further out into the street, um, and initially thinking that might be a benefit to the, to the uh, pedestrians, but hearing from the, the e and TAC, they told us that oftentimes, you know, as a, if you're vision impaired, it's, it feels dangerous to be out on the bulb out. So we ended up kind of walking back from the bulb out idea and, and moving to just a, crop, a raised crosswalk. So those types of insights are always really helpful. And so we really appreciate the input that we get from those committees. I also wanted to acknowledge our uh, engineering and design teams here. We have Kimley Horn as our chief civil design team. And then uh, recently we, we started working with Pavement Engineering and Inc. And they are our kind of our pavement specialists. So they provided input on some of our decisions as far as the treatment that we were gonna select for the project. All right, here on this slide, I wanted to give a little bit of uh, detail on the pedestrian and bicycle safety improvements. So we'll start first with the uh, cycling uh, improvements. So we already have what the class two bike lane, which is a dedicated bike lane on either side. But what we're adding to that is uh, the current roadway has about 13 feet for, of width for each vehicle lane. And so by reducing the width of that lane, we should have a, a slight reduction in speed and then also allows us the opportunity to add what, what are called buffered bike lanes. So in that fig, the image on the left, you can see that there's a little um, striped area that provides a buffer between the cyclists and the, and the vehicles. So there's a little bit more safety there makes it a little bit more easy for the drivers to see that there's a bike lane and then should make it a more enjoyable experience for those that are using this as a, as a cycling route. Um, in addition to that, I don't have a figure showing it, but we can see it in a later slide that we're also gonna be adding green and bike lanes. So at the start of each intersection, those areas where the bike lane initiates will be highlighted in green paint and that's becoming more and more of a kind of a regional standard that we're seeing throughout the community and throughout the state where that just highlights the fact that there's a bike lane and so vehicles making turns onto the street will be kind of reminded that to, to make some space for the cyclists as they're coming up and down the street. 
And then now moving on to the, the pedestrian improvements for the crossings. So one thing like we had mentioned earlier that, you know, being that there's only two places to cross the street right now, and with the, you know, completion of the brand new library, we wanted to see what we could do to make it a, a make some more safe spots for pedestrians to come across the street. And so uh, as part of our survey, we kind of, we looked at the different locations we were contemplating and, and highlighted these. And so we, we fell on here is um, what we're gonna install are these raised crosswalks or speed tables. Uh, the same design that we used over on Jade Street and 42nd a few years back that has been well received by the community and did demonstrate to show a reduction in speed for the, for the vehicles, but also provided uh, more visibility for the pedestrians crossing the street. And by, by raising the sidewalk or the crosswalk, pedestrians are about six inches taller than they would be normally. So they're easier to see for, for, the, for vehicles coming. It also gives them a little bit more of a vantage point. And as a, so it kind of slows cars down right before they get to the crossing and also allows the pedestrians to go across. Um, another thing that we'll be adding to these raised crosswalks are the, the RRFB rectangular rapid flashing beacons, which is a, there'll be a push button system where um, we might, you might be familiar with seeing those over by the DMV and over by, uh, let's see, we have it over by New Brighton School where you press the button and you get a series of flashing lights that really dem highlights the fact that a pedestrian is gonna be crossing. So each of those three crossings will have those as well. Now moving on to the intersection enhancements, uh, we'll start with the, the intersection at 41st and Claire's on the left side of the screen. Um, what we'll be doing here is, is again, you can see those, those green bike lanes and that um, currently as a cyclist going westbound on Claire's when you hit 41st, there, there really isn't a dedicated bike lane, the bike lane ends. And so what we're doing here by, by slightly narrowing the roadway for the vehicles, we're adding a little bit more space for, for the cyclists to come through. And that way they have a dedicated lane to put themselves in to either make, uh, go straight across 41st or turn left and go south on 41st while still allowing vehicles to turn right and have that dedicated right lane um, going north towards the freeway. And then looking over at the library intersection at Wharf Road, we're happy to be able to provide this and uh, council member uh, Brown might be familiar with this concept she brought to us a handful of years ago, which was a, a little kind of interesting pamphlet on uh, intersection enhancements. And it was a, a pamphlet that showed all these different types of treatments that can be done within intersections to just bring more visibility um, and a little bit of color and you know excitement to the intersection. And so we thought it, it, was, a, it was a really nice add to the project by having, it's, if you can tell, if you look a little bit, like turn your head a little, you can tell that it's supposed to be a bookshelf um, that's going across the crosswalk. And so that should um, kind of highlight the fact that we're at the library, but also bring a little bit more color. And that way when pedestrians are there, um, the, the idea is that uh, vehicles are just gonna be able to, it just brightens the intersection up. Um, and then in addition, we're adding the green cycle track, which is a dedicated uh, green bike lane that shows that cyclists are will be crossing in that area and again that that improves the safety and visibility of the cyclists at an intersection uh, moving on to our kind of current estimate for schedule cost and funding so right now uh, we're finished with complete completed our engineering design and with your approval tonight we would be able to take this project out to bid for construction um, with that happening you know, approximately a month for bid opening, um, puts us into construction, um, depending on the contractor's availability, probably late into the late summer, fall to winter, and, and be finished before the winter starts. Um, from a funding perspective, um, kind of outline the funding sources we have. It's a little bit of a blend of funding from Measure D, some general funds, and also um, some funding allocations, a combination of funding allocations through the RTC. Um, with the total total funding amount is, is uh, $100,000 or so about greater than our project estimate at a million one. And so that gives us a you know, comfort that we're fully funded for the project and able to bring this project to the community. Uh, so with that, uh, we're, our recommended action is for, um, we, we've asked for council to approve these plans and specifications to allow us to bid this project. 
um, and I'm happy to answer any questions or receive any comments from council or the community. Okay, questions from council members on uh, Kailash's report. Thank you, Kailash. Yes, uh, council member Bertrand. You're on, you're on mute still. <laughs> Um, thank you very much, Kailash, for your report. Um, answered quite a few questions I had in reading the uh, report to begin with in, this, in the staff presentation in our agenda. Um, originally, I thought we were going to get some RDA money for this because, you know, at the time we were thinking about it as a project for RDA. Did that never um, take any funds from RDA or did it just go poof when Governor Brown took everything away? So I think. Go ahead, Jamie. Uh, I was I didn't know you were on Steve. Yes, the, the, the RDA funding, um, we don't have any RDA funding for this project. And when the RDAs were dissolved, that funding went away. Okay, so there was some funding, it just got clawed back. Yeah, actually, Steve, you may be able to help me out here. My recollection is, is that we did set aside some funding at one point and then it got reprogrammed into another project. I don't remember if we ever put RDA dollars in though. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from council members? Um, seeing none, um, Kailash, yeah, thank you for that presentation. Um, I think we're very pleased to see the improvements happening on Clare Street. But um, um, I guess a couple of questions. I wonder if you could bring up that slide showing uh, the intersection at 41st Avenue and the uh, activity of the bike lane. This one? Yeah, yeah, that one right there. Um, does that, I mean, with the green dots, does that show that uh, the bike lane um, kind of, of swerves to the center as it goes across 41st Avenue? That's correct, yes. And that was a design consideration that we brought to the um, bicycle committee. Um, we had originally had that hugging the, the curb line the whole way. And it was a comment from the bicycle committee that this this is kind of the more um, I guess common way that they're trying to to update um, commuting opportunities for cyclists that you give them a dedicated lane so that instead of being in conflict with both the right turn um, pocket they're they're kind of in a in a zone where they're no longer dealing with that conflicting cross traffic so instead of potentially dealing with the right turn uh, vehicles at the at the stop they've had the opportunity to move over um, and, and be in a protected, um, dedicated bike lane between the straight um, and the right turn lane. And that was what they recommended. It's similar to what we, uh, we kind of did that similarly over on Bromer Street where we had the green bike box. It's not quite the same because there's a dedicated right turn, but this was, um, it was something that we, we ran past um, that committee and this was a strong recommendation by them to, to, to opt augment the way we have the striping plan and, and put it in this orientation. Does, does that answer your question? Uh, <coughs> I think your, your audio might have heard. I think we lost Nick's story. I think so. Yeah. Well, while he's signing back on, Jacques, do you have another question? Uh, yes, I do, uh, Vice Mayor. So, um, you know, I note in your presentation, you did um, quite a bit of um, um, reach out over time, uh, even before you started uh, with the neighborhood. Uh, I think that's great. Is um, the city developing um, the same kind of outreach to people because there's a lot of um, like the HOAs on one side near the library, they can't get out, right? So how's that being handled so that when the street's being worked, we won't have um, cars trying to cross? Do you mean during construction? Yes, I do. Yeah, so that, that again, was that's kind of why we we've, uh, were very happy that the cold in place recycling was an option that we could use to treat this because really it's only going to be a portion of the day that you won't be able to drive on the road. So the way that the project will go and slide back so that 
that kind of bottom right picture there, it's basically a train of, of construction vehicles that the first the first vehicle is churning up the existing asphalt and then the second one brings it in and actually mixes that up and then relays it down. And so you end up with a new road surface immediately. Um, so that allows uh, vehicles back on the road that same day. Um, and then you come back another with the with an overlay that goes on top of that. And so the, the impacts to the community are really brief. And so even we won't end up with having people not able to come in and out that same day. I think there'll, there'll be a duration during the middle of the day that they aren't able to enter and exit. But outside of that, those all the driveways will be accessible by the end of that, that work day. Yeah, I know uh, the city did a pretty good job because it was on Monterey Avenue, went across my, my, the front of my house. So as long as the neighbors know, and you know, it seems to me that you are reaching out to the neighbors and that could be important for them. Oh, right. No, in addition to that, um, we'll be, we'll be sending out flyers and postcards for the, the, we always do that with a kind of a, about a 300 foot buffer, depending, we kind of look at it closely to make sure we're capturing all the immediately affected residents and we'll send out information about the, once the contractor is selected and we have a sense of what a timeline for the project, we'll send out postcards, um, providing project contact information for myself as well as the contractor and then a, a brief kind of expectation of what the timeline will be for construction related impacts. Uh, one follow up question, uh, this overlay after grinding, et cetera, does this save the, uh, the city money with um, material? I mean, it's faster, but uh, is this uh, less costly and still effective? Yeah, I'd, I'd say, you know, it's hard to, you know, predict exactly how things would go. But yeah, the other options would be to grind out the entire road, like eight inches of road base and bring in all new material. Um, you know, another consideration there is just from an environmental perspective, a lot of times, you know, you, you want to, I guess we try to think of our, our asphalt, even our existing asphalt, no matter what the condition of it is, it's still an asset of ours. So by using the cold in place recycling method, we're making use of the existing asphalt rather than spending you know, trucks and trucks of material off hauling to the dump and bringing in all brand new material. We're still having to bring in some new material for the top, but we're able to make use of the existing asphalt, add some um, some treatment to it to strengthen and kind of solidify it a little bit more and then put it right back in place. And so it's both a speed, uh, kind of an environmental kind of recycling method um, and, and uh, you know, that, I think those are those are some of the benefits of going that route. Thank you very much. Sounds great. Thanks. Um, I, I guess I had some technical difficulties and uh, got knocked off there for a minute. But, uh, Kailash, if we could go back to the 41st Avenue yep. um, intersection. And I guess my, um, my question was um, whether there's any concerns, because it appears that the cars and the bikes are crossing at that point. Is that accurate yes that's right yeah i don't know when what when you clicked off but um so that's correct so what the cyclists will do they'll be coming down uh coming westbound on claire's and at that section where there's the green lane that crosses that's kind of a that is a crossing area and that's where the cyclists um are able to cross over and then turn get onto a dedicated bike lane in the middle um, and the, the rationale behind that was that there's a, there's a right turn lane pocket. Um, the alternative would be to have the cyclist right along the curb line. Um, but then what we, you have there is you have the conflict of when a green light, when the light turns green, you have cyclists wanting to either go straight or left, but you also have cars that want to turn right. And so that's a, you know, it's a, it becomes a, a zone where you could have a little bit more conflict, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, opportunities to have, you know, what you wouldn't want to have is a conflict with those two types of pedestrian modes of travel. Um, so this was, uh, the, the rationale here was to give the cyclists a protected lane that allows them to either go straight or left. Um, and, and this was a strong recommendation from the, the bicycle committee at the RTC. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you mentioned it's a protected lane. Um, I can't, from this uh, drawing, I can't quite tell how it's protected. Is that because it's in the, it's, well, tell me how it's a protected bike lane. Sure, yeah. I, I would say, you know, in, in comparison to the way it is now. So right now the bike lane ends um, back where, right after, right after Derby, which is this first um, green box, that's Derby Avenue to the north. So right after that, currently the bike lane just 
disappears and we only have the right turn lane and the vehicle straight left lane. And so by slightly uh, narrowing the vehicle lane, we've added the dedicated bike lane all the way to the end of the intersection. Um, and then the cyclists can go all the way to the queue, all the way to the front. They don't need to wait behind any of the vehicles because currently if you, if you cycle down that street, you're kind of in a limbo where you're, you're you know, you're either behind the cars that are turning right or you're, you squeeze and you kind of ride the lane between the two cars. Um, and so this provides an, an opportunity for cyclists to have their dedicated space um, that will allow them to make either a straight or left turning movement. Okay, I, I guess the, the theory is, is that the cars and the bikes there are going to be at conflict at some point. Right. Um, even if you ran the bike lane all the way up to 41st Avenue on the side of the road. Correct. And this is just moving that kind of crossing pattern back away from the intersection where theoretically it would be safer uh, to do that. That's right. Okay. Okay. Um, Steve, did you want to uh, add something to that discussion? Yeah. I just wanted to mention that this is a common alignment we use. It's actually the intersection of Bay Avenue and Capitola Avenue on Bay as you're coming into the city where we have a dedicated right onto Capitola Avenue there. The bike lane shifts there too. And also right at 41st and Claire's in the southbound direction um, in front of Burger King. There's a bike lane that switches away from to the outside of the dedicated right turn. So it's very something bicyclists are very com uh, comfortable with and right. is certainly okay. the preferred design. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'll ask, uh, are there any other questions on the staff report? Seeing none, I'm going to um, go out to uh, the public, our attendees. Um, if you'd like to comment on this item, uh, just raise your hand in Zoom. I see one up now. Um, or you can dial um, star nine on your phone um, and the moderator will give you three minutes to speak. Um, you can also send an email uh, to public comment at ci.capitola.ca.us. Um, and Larry, if you could um, um, allow yeah. the attendees to... Yeah, so we have, well, Mayor Story, we have Bridget Hawkins. Um, okay, thank you. Ms. Hawkins, you want to go ahead. Hi, thank you. I just want to say I was on the Government Academy with Jamie. I really enjoyed it. Um, I'm a resident of Claire Street, actually where the proposed crosswalk is going to be, like right in front of my house, condos. Um, is that, I think you said there's just the one crosswalk. Is that also going to be a calming bump? And did you say there was a second calming bump? I'm sorry if I missed it. Yeah, Kayla, do you want to respond to um, this talking? Sure, yeah, thank you for the question. And yeah, I may have not highlighted that accurately. There's There are three crossings, so there's one at 42nd, one mid-block right at the middle um, kind of of the street of the of Claire's midway between 41st and Wharf, and then one just to the right of 46th. So there'll be a total of three raised crosswalks. All three will be raised, and all three will have the, um, the rapid flashing beacon with a push button there. Okay, three of them. And then two more questions on that. One is, is are you reducing parking on that, on Claire's, on the street? There, we, there are a total of uh, eight parking spots that are going to be um, have to be reduced as a result of the installation of those those pedestrian safety measures. Um, and then the other question is: there's quite a bit of traffic from fire and police, especially fire, coming down Claire's. Is that now that there's the calming bumps? Are they going to be doing an alternate route, or has that been thought through? So in our experience, no, that hasn't been posed a challenge to any of those vehicles. Um, we have them on Jade Street and 42nd currently. Um, and, and prior to installing those, we did we did communicate with emergency services and that there's no conflict with them able to use these streets. It just, um, you know, it, I think the, the average speed is, you know, you have to go from a little bit slower than you would, so you're not going to go the full speed limit. Um, but you can still easily travel over and it doesn't it doesn't preclude any of those types of vehicles from being able to access the area. 
Great. No, appreciate all the work. I'm sure it'll look great. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Hawkins. Are there any other attendees that would like to comment on this um, item? Larry, do you? Yeah, Mayor Story, I do not see any other attendees with their hands raised on this, and we have not received any email. Okay, I'll bring this back to the council. But before we um, proceed with um, uh, a motion, uh, KLS, I did have one follow-up question um, concerning the crosswalk in front of the library across Wharf Road. Um, you know, with the books, it looks and the different colors, it looks very attractive. I'm just wanting to know about the durability and um, um, and how well it would wear and the of uh, refreshing it at some point in the future? Yeah, that's a good question. So the, the material that it's going to go down with is, is similar to what the green bike lanes currently in the city are using. So it's a thermoplastic. Um, it's a, it has a texture to it, so it's not smooth. So you know, pedestrians will be able to walk. You know, it's not going to create any slipping issues. Um, it will wear over time, but it's definitely stronger than any type of paint that you typically see. It's it's going to have a similar service life as what we would see for any of the other thermoplastic that goes down, and that definitely lasts a good number of years more than uh, typical paint, but it probably will need some refreshing at times. Uh, the City of San Jose has done a, quite a number of these, and it seems that they're, they're experiencing that it's lasting fairly well, um, but not to say that there won't be a need to maybe either refresh or, or you know, um, potentially, I would imagine mainly during within the vehicle, like the tire lanes that are going to wear faster, mm, but it, it shouldn't be something that we're needing to do every few years. It should last a good five to ten, five to ten years before we're having to do a, a, you know, a full new repaint of that area. Yeah. Is, is it done with a, uh, and therefore would be, you know, refreshed using a stencil? It is, yeah, it's a stencil of, of sorts that would you be used. Um, so, you know, and then that layout, the, the exact design, I think we, that's, that's our, you know, our, our mock-up for what we are anticipating it to be. Um, I think the, the exact color scheme could be updated if that we felt like that wasn't going to work, but currently that's what we're moving forward with. We went through a few different color options and felt like that looked like the best kind of fit for, for the area. Okay, well, thank you. Um, so now I will bring this to the council uh, for further council deliberation and um, hopefully uh, a motion. Um, yes, Council Member Brown. Thank you. I'm really excited about this project. I think it's long awaited. We've been talking about uh, the need for improvements on Clare Street for a really long time. Um, and I'm kind of uh, pleasantly surprised to see this decorative crosswalk. I can't believe that you've all held on to that um, idea that I I brought to you like four, that had to be three or four years ago. It was way pre-pandemic um, from, from some kind of brochure or information that I think I had seen it at one of the League of Cities conferences or something. So uh, I'm, I'm so excited to see that that's uh, still around. I'd completely forgotten about it. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited about this, and I would like to move approval of the staff recommendations. I will definitely second that, and thank you, Kailash, for all your hard work and the presentation. I'm super excited to see this go through. Okay, good. Um, there's been a motion and a uh, second, and uh, Council Member Bertrand, do you have a comment? Yeah, um, I'm very excited about this as well. Uh, it's been a project that's been a long time in the making, and you know, a particular issue is um, a lot of the residents in the HOA and, and other areas on um, the other side of the street, um, <laughs> they really have to cross on their own unless they're gonna go to 41st or the park. And then the other aspect is it's very dark at night. I often walk there at night, and um, you know, you just don't see anything at all pretty much. So with the crossings and the blinking lights, uh, thanks uh, Kailash for putting that in the plan. And I think all in all, you know, I haven't heard of any accidents and uh, fatalities on that street, but I think a lot of people will feel a lot more comfortable because of the improvements. And thank you very much again. All right, thank you. Um, with that, I'll ask um, um, the clerk to uh, conduct a roll call vote. Council Member Bertrand. 
I agree. Council Member Brown. Aye. Vice Mayor Kaiser. Aye. Mayor Story. Aye. And that motion passes unanimously uh, of the Mayor Story, we're having a little bit of trouble with your audio. Do you want to maybe try shutting off your video and seeing if that improves the audio? Okay. Thank you for um, Oh, Vice Mayor Kaiser, you might be on the hot seat. Okay, here we <laughs> go. So we're moving on to um, 9B. We have a presentation regarding the Senate Bill 9 and Draft City Ordinance. We are hearing from Katie, I believe. That's correct. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sounds good. Looks good okay. too. Okay. Yeah, it does. Okay, well, thank you. Yeah. Um, good evening, Vice Mayor Kaiser and Council. Um, hopefully, our mayor can reconnect and turn. Um, tonight, before you, I want to introduce the SB9 ordinance. And this is, uh, I'll be bringing this to you at our next hearing for a first reading. But I wanted to get this out to you early because it is uh, a new land use ordinance, it's a little bit complex and just give you enough time to read through it before we I bring it back at the next meeting. So it's going to be a high level review and please, as you go through it um, over the next couple of weeks, feel free to reach out to me if you want me to guide you through any specific points, because there's a lot more in the ordinance that I'm presenting this evening. Um, so see if I can get my presentation to, there we go. So within SB9, SB9 took effect on January 1st, 2022. Um, within SB9, it's a big game changer for, for the R1 single family neighborhoods. Every lot within a single family neighborhood, if it meets certain qualifications, um, it, it can now be split into two lots. And on each lot, you can have two new residential units. Um, there's a requirement at the state that we allow each unit um, at least to have 800 square foot feet per unit. And then the minimum parcel size for the new lot split is 1,200 square feet. So you can get up to 1,600 square feet on 1,200 square feet of lots. So two units per lot. Um, so this takes uh, effect in our R1 zone. So here all of the lighter yellow uh, parcels are capital is R1 zone. Um, as we started looking at SB9 with our planning commission and talking about when, when an SB9 project comes in, it has to be reviewed administratively by staff. And um, you're, we're allowed to adopt an ordinance that creates objective standards. So uh, standards that can be measured and they have to be uh, quantitative. And um, so, we started to look at the SB9 model, uh, SB9 with Planning Commission, and as we got deeper into it, um, we're starting to notice some trends of how SB9 actually sits on our small lots in Capitola. So uh, we looked at three typical lot sizes. One, the Riverview Terrace area is made up of um, 40 by 70 square foot, 40 by 70 lots of 2,800 square feet, the jewel box at 3,200 square feet, and then Cliffwood Heights with larger lots at 6,000. So here you're seeing the Cliffwood Heights lots, typical size is about 6,000 square feet. This is one neighborhood in which SB9 will work in Capitola. Um, the Depot Hill neighborhood, your typical lot size is 3,200 square feet. Your typical lot is 40 by 80. Um, SB9 doesn't fit as perfectly in uh, Depot Hill neighborhood. Um, so then in working with um, this, we had an outside consultant draw up some models for us to, to show exactly 
as we started talking about the placement of parking, how would this work? Um, so the lots you're seeing here, I thought I'd first uh, show where it actually works. So this would be a Clifford Heights lot, 60 feet wide, 100 feet deep. Um, under the code, we were required, under SB9, you're, you can require four feet um, side and rear yard setbacks, and then we put in a front yard setback of 15 feet, which is typical for our R1 zone. And here you're seeing models that work within um, uh, two stories, and there's one parking space for each unit. And um, the Planning Commission, in considering SB9, had directed staff at the first meeting that they'd really like to see shared driveway access in order to uh, preserve street parking. So the more driveway access that you put in, the more curb cuts you lose on street parking. This next model is um, a 40 by 80 lot. So this is typical for your Depot Hill neighborhood. And here you're seeing um, um, under the scenario on the top right, it's a two stories of SB9. And each unit's required to have one parking space. And so under this scenario, um, these are all 800 square foot units that you're seeing. By putting um, in that scenario is parking in the front, the SB9 units can fit within two stories, but there's minimal any green space or open space on the lot, and you lose all your street parking. Um, on the scenarios B and C, you're seeing a shared access point. Well, B is a one driveway. Um, and at that point, in order to accommodate the 800 square feet, we um, the model, you have to go up to a third story. So that is what you're seeing here. And then on the right, um, under C, there's a one shared access along the side, but the two units in the front would also need um, driveways into garages under them. So really we have got one model that works um, under B that is a shared access that maintains the street parking. So on March 31st, the Planning Commission first saw this in February, and then we came back with these concepts. And we asked the commission, looking at these different models, where do they land in terms of, would they rather the parking be in the front, or would they rather go to three stories and have that shared access? Um, the commission came back, and three out of the five supported the uh, scenario B, so a shared access, parking in the back, um, and not allowing street park, uh, the parking to take up the whole front yard. So under that scenario, the street parking is preserved. So in drafting the ordinance and knowing from these models what would work and what would not, um, we drafted an ordinance that for lots greater than 5,500 square feet, because that's kind of the magic number where SB9 works in Capitola, that you can get a full 15-foot front yard setback and parking, a shared parking configuration towards the back and only one with a shared driveway. So all of the standards can be, be met on these larger lots. However, the, the, the ordinance has all of the standards you see in this slide in it for lots greater than 5,500 square feet. Then the ordinance has a section for lots that are less than 5,500 square feet. And what we did there is as the lot size decreases, the setback decrease in the ordinance and height, additional height is allowed. So you'll, when you go through the second table for lots less than 5,500 square feet, that's what you're seeing is this additional height will be allowed um, and decreased setback. We sent our SD9 ordinance over to the Coastal Commission to get input from them. As well, um, there was also a document that I included in the packet that came out from uh, Coastal Commission. And really, what the what the Coastal Commission is saying is that they want SB9 projects to be in harmony with the Coastal Act. So we have a duty to protect our coastal access and recreation um, opportunities. So in looking at SB9 um, and getting the feedback we got from the Coastal Commission, one modification we made is that SB9 projects will be prohibited in areas with geological hazards, so that's along our bluff. So 
they'll also be prohibited within the 100 and 500 year flood hazard areas, so along um, the Soquel Creek area. And um, also, they'll, they're prohibited in environmentally sensitive habitat areas. Another change that we made um, to protect our coastal resources is access is a big deal in terms of uh, allowing the public to get to the beach. So under SB9, there is a, an exception that within, if a um, development is in within one half mile of walking distance of a high quality transit corridor or a major transit stop, or if within one block there is a car share vehicle that they, it's, um, Parking can be exempt. However, within our ordinance, uh, trying to uh, maintain those parking spaces along our streets are very important. We are not allowing this exemption in the neighborhoods that are closer to our beach. So the Jewel Box, um, Upper Riverview and Riverview, and uh, Depot Hill, and uh, some areas north of Park Avenue and the Village. So that was my high-level overview of SB9, and our next step is I plan to bring a first reading of this to the City Council at our next meeting on May 12th, um, and then the second reading on May 26th, um, and then following that, it will go to the Coastal Commission for certification. Um, and like I said, this is a very, it's a complex ordinance. I'm happy to spend time with you over the next few weeks if you read through it and have questions and with that I'm available for questions thank you are there any questions and I just I seem to be having an activity issue so um, you'll hear my voice but you won't see my face for the duration and and I want to welcome uh, council member Brooks to the meeting um, are there questions on the staff report No, I've seen none. Um, Media, I, I did have a question um, in relationship to um, the limitations on demolition of affordable and rental housing. And I'm referencing page 58 of the agenda packet, item uh, C. And um, the way the ordinance reads that, um, you know, it's a parcel that has been um, um, in which an owner of residential real property has exercised the owner's right, um, and it says to evict tenants due to the property owner's decision to no longer use the property for rental housing. Um, however, under the statute, um, it doesn't make reference to eviction. It just says if the owner withdraws the accommodation. Um, and I just wanted to, I guess, raise that question. Um, and I don't, you don't necessarily need to answer it tonight. Um, maybe I know we're going to be looking at this again in the future. Um, so I thought maybe if nothing else, I'd just pose the question um, and you can maybe bring that back to us um, at the next session. Yes, I'll, I'll review that with our city attorney um, in preparation of the next meeting. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and um, seeing no other question, um, and since uh, Councilmember Brooks is now here, um, I'm going to reorder the agenda um, so that um, we can, I think, deal with the topic that most of our attendees are here this evening uh, to to participate in. Um, so what I would like to do is um, defer item uh, 9C uh, until the um, end of the agenda um, and bring up now item 9E, which is temporary outdoor dining. Um, then we'll go to the temporary village parking committee goals and appointment. Um, and then come back at the end to item 9C. Um, so with that, let's move on to item 9E, Temporary Outdoor Dining Program. 
and the recommended action is to receive a report on the Coastal Commission certification of Ordinance 1050, outdoor dining in the public right away. And two, consider adopting the proposed resolution extending the COVID-19 temporary outdoor dining use permit with new modified conditions, including fees. When we have the staff report, please. Excuse me, Mayor, sorry to interrupt. Um, I do need to recuse myself for my um, financial relationship with Paradise Beach Grill, which is within the village. All right, thank you, Vice Mayor Kaiser. Well, keep an eye on us and so you know when to come back. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, can you see that okay? It looks good. Thank you, Ed. Okay, so tonight I'm going to provide you with an update to our temporary outdoor dining program. Um, a little background to begin. Back um, in 2020, we, the City Council passed emergency order number four, which allowed local businesses to utilize outdoor space for commercial activities, both on public streets and private parking lots. Um, we've continued this item, this will uh, four times at this point. So the, tonight would be the fifth continuation of the outdoor dining um, emergency order. Um, the last time it was continued was on December 1st, 2021, and it was in conjunction with when we had completed our new ordinance for outdoor dining, and we anticipated the outdoor dining to be certified by the Coastal Commission in either April or May, um, and so it was continued to May 31st, and at this point in time, the Coastal Commission certification is currently delayed. Uh, we're working through a few items with the Coastal Commission on our ordinance. And we, um, so tonight the discussion is whether or not the outdoor dining should be continued beyond May 31st, and if so, how. Um, so outdoor dining, the current state, this, the um, temporary outdoor dining, there's 19 active temporary outdoor dining permits. Uh, one is on the wharf. There are 16 outside the village and then another 12 within the village. Um, so I'll start with outside the village. Um, there were a number of more of outdoor dining um, establishments outside the village. Many of the restaurants have, IHOP had one with a big tent. Many of them have gone away and um, have reverted back to parking uh, due to the use of the indoor space now. Um, but there are six located outside the village um, they're in private parking lots or on private open space. And in our uh, review of these, they seem to be well-maintained. They're on their private property and they remain available for patrons. Um, within the village, there are 13. So 10 of these are uh, for restaurants and they're located within 27 public parking spaces. And then two of the outdoor dining space in the village are within sidewalks. And then one is on the wharf. So these are some great pictures of showing active outdoor dining or uh, um, ready for activity in the top picture. So as we've been working through this, I want to first state that in the report, I've brought up some ongoing concerns. Many of the restaurants, um, there's been great successes. And so I feel bad kind of picking on <laughs> what isn't working, but I want to say there has been great success out there. Um, there are many instances in which there are uh, exemplary um, use of the outdoor dining, but just be, we have had some ongoing concerns. So I'm going to highlight those tonight. Um, one concern we have is that the outdoor dining is um, not always available to patrons. And um, this is valued public parking areas. So when we see the outdoor dining continue to not be utilized by patrons for the use that it, it was, um, that we're planning on it for, it's, um, and also the, it's been unorganized as well. So it doesn't even look welcoming to the patrons to come in and sit down. Um, 
The upkeep and maintenance has been an issue. So there are a lot of broken pots out there. There are plants that haven't been replanted into pots. And then um, we've been, we spent 10 days monitoring. Uh, there was um, we had a group that would go out at lunch and then also at night at 6 p.m. to check on how many um, of the outdoor dining locations were utilized and what condition they were in. And, you know, there was um, a common occurrence was to find trash on the ground. And not only would it be there for one day, you know, under the notes, it would, the same trash would be there two, three days later. So um, just upkeep and maintenance has been an issue. Um, our city benches were included in the original design. We're just about to enter into our third year of, or our third summer of outdoor dining if this continues. And at this point, uh, we really like to remove the city benches from the design, from the outdoor dining. We've had many comments and, uh, and requests from the public to return the benches to their original use and for the good of the public. Um, so that is one of our suggestions tonight is to uh, return the benches to their original location. And also when we consider um, this, I just want, I listed the upcoming special events for the council to be aware of. The first one, um, the Capitola Rod and Custom Classic Car Show is on June 11th through 12th. So um, we'll just keep that date in mind. Um, so how should we address these challenges that we've seen? Uh, we've done a lot of brainstorming on the outdoor dining. And tonight we're asking um, whether or not it should continue. If the council would like it to continue, um, that we're suggesting that it, we add an open for use requirement um, to ensure that any outdoor dining is open for a minimum of five days per week and that the seating is made available for patrons. Um, where the second suggestion is to remove all city benches. In its place, we would require that pots be um, installed every five feet. Um, and then we're suggesting requiring a maintenance deposit of $500. And what this would be for is to prevent the issues I just highlighted. So on random, occasions staff would go through and uh, check on the outdoor dining um, and see if they're clean, see if plants are alive and maintained, has the ground been swept. Um, and when we find non-compliance, it could result in an administrative citation. Um, and then that administrative citation would come out of the $500 deposit. If the $500 deposit were to be depleted for multiple um, um, citation. At that point, we would um, we would revoke the permit for non-compliance. Um, the other, the fourth item that we're suggesting is to require rent of a dollar fifty per square foot um, per month, due to, um, which would be due on the fifteenth of the month prior. So this is approximately two hundred and eighty-three dollars per month per parking space. And um, that having it due on the 15th of the month prior allows us to know whether or not a parking space will be converted. Also, as I mentioned with the car show coming up, um, we would want this to take effect in May. So by May 15th, we would know exactly who is continuing um, to participate beyond May 31st. Um, so. Also, if, if the city council would like to extend, we are going to have to modify the resolution to uh, add more specificity there. So it, um, an extension, adding an extension date to the resolution, I've got two examples up here that I can pull this slide back up, but really we, um, the council can either extend all temporary permits to a specific date, um, or you can separate um, the village from the citywide, knowing that the village, um, the, the suggested date right now from staff is that the temporary outdoor dining be extended um, two months following the Coastal Commission certification. So that, the, certi the Coastal Commission certification, those, um, the outdoor dining program will be available to all of the restaurants in the village. 
the restaurants outside the village, um, the six that I mentioned earlier, in order for them to continue outdoor dining, they would have to come in to the planning, to planning and amend their conditional use permit to add um, a permanent outdoor dining. So that the city council has the option tonight to um, make different dates for the extensions between the village and the rest of the city. So in the recommendation is to consider adopting the proposed resolution with the recommended changes, extending the COVID-19 temporary outdoor dining use permits with new modified conditions, including fees and adding the therefore provisions for the extension date. So with that, I'm available for questions. Yeah, Council Member Bertrand. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation, Katie. And um, I took particular note of your monitoring. And um, yes, I, I think it points out some issues, um, not only cleanliness, but also the use of the uh, parking spots. And, you know, we provided these parking spots so that they could be used by the restaurants. Um, would you say that there was a decreased use of the parklet areas after we sort of start relaxing from COVID and more people were willing to go indoors in the restaurants. Did you get a sense of that? Because I'm trying to understand what's driving this. That seems to be part of it. Um, yeah, since, um, since restaurants have opened to full occupancy and as people are getting more comfortable, I do think because there, there are additional seats inside and the comfort level is increasing that more seats are being utilized inside and less outside. So, and did you talk to any of the uh, restaurant owners or management of the restaurant owners and get a sense that um, this may make them reevaluate whether they want to keep a parklet, especially at the increased cost and the cost to build one? This is something to be determined, but you know we're sort of at a juncture right now. I'm just wondering what kind of sense you got. You know, I've only talked to a couple of the restaurant owners about their intentions. If, if, if this were to be continued um, and we were to add a fee, and what I am hearing is that they would like to continue with their outdoor dining. Okay, and then I, I like the idea of returning the benches. I, I think most of us have gotten emails, especially at the beginning that uh, visitors to Capitola miss the benches uh, so they can watch the waves and uh, Junior Guard is coming up. You know, we, we just love having uh, parents watch the Junior Guard <laughs> participants sitting on a bench. So that's greatly missed. Um, was that brought up to any of the um, restaurateurs because they're going to have to provide the, um, the planners and, and the new barrier basically? So I, I, I sent out an email to all of the participating restaurants um, last week with a connection to the staff report. We've heard public comment from quite a few in, in the form of letters or, or emails um, in the past 24 hours that were, uh, so there has been that feedback, but there, the, uh, the link to, the, to this meeting with the staff report was sent to all participating restaurants. So everyone should be informed at this point of the action that city council is taking this evening. Okay, thank you very much. And I appreciate your survey. It, it points out a lot of issues that I think we need to address. And I too have gotten comments about uh, how our parklets seem to appear to visitors to Capitol. And you know, that leads me to have quite a bit of concern. Thank you. The question, oh yes, council member Brooks. Thank you, Mayor Story. Kitty, I may have, may have missed this in your report um, in regards to why really extending the temporary ordinance then moving forward with the permanent. Um, I didn't see it, maybe I missed it, like a time, is there like timeline issues? Is what, what's really the, the issue there of not moving forward with an ordinance? And that, so that's my first part of the question. The second part, has staff looked at so one thing i mentioned at our last conversation was that i really wanted to see the esplanade change in the way we and we've seen um in change in the sense of like it looking better and i haven't seen that happen at all but i'm seeing a lot of the other uh businesses around 
um, the Esplanade do so? And so has there been any discussion with staff about not including the Esplanade and um, what that would entail and what we need to, you know, if, if we were to go in that direction? I'll, your first question was regarding the timing of the ordinance and uh, why we're here. So that that's due to our Coastal Commission certification of our ordinance. It's been held up. Um, there are a couple items that they're not in agreement with the way in which our ordinance was drafted. So we are trying to work through those with their staff. Um, so at this point, we don't, we're definitely not going to be on their May agenda. Um, and we'll, we'll see from there. So we're suggesting that it be continued for two months after it gets certified by the Coastal Commission, since that is what is holding us up at this point. Your second question um, was related to um, just overall appearance and hopefully it was going to look better um, and whether or not staff has talked about limiting the outdoor dining to certain areas of the village. Um, so, that's really within your purview of this ordinance. If, um, if the city council wants to um, bring back parking on certain streets and allow outdoor dining on other streets, that, that's a modification we can definitely make to the, to the order tonight. And, and Mayor, if I may, but as follow up, so the decision we're making today to extend the temporary is pretty much we have to because we're waiting to get feedback from the Coastal Commission. That makes sense to me. Um, the, the information that we sent to the Coastal Commission, does that, do we have the flexibility to change the streets should council agree to um, remove the Esplanade or any of the other streets or, or is, is that something that we would have to make that decision tonight is what I heard you say, is that correct? If you didn't want the ordinance to continue on certain streets, you would make that decision tonight. Okay, and that wouldn't have an effect though on the two month extension of the temporary, that would have an effect for the permanent. It would not have, it would not have an effect on the permanent ordinance. The permanent ordinance, out, um, it, it's very specific of which streets it would be permitted on in the future. So that action tonight would not influence the permanent ordinance. It would only influence the decision tonight on the temporary ordinance. And so my final question then is how can we affect or to make changes to the permanent ordinance? Is that going to, when can we make that decision? So that's under a review of uh, the Coastal Commission at this point. If the city council chose to amend the existing ordinance, that's something it's um, you'd have to request that staff bring it back and uh, we would discuss what the next steps would be as it, because as of right now we have it submitted to the Coastal Commission for their certification so okay all right thank you all right. I see staff on there I appreciate seeing staff I think we Katie got answered my question but thank you council member Brown I just want to clarify so that, that I understand. If we were to make changes to our permanent ordinance that's under review by the Coastal Commission right now, it would need to go back to the Coastal Commission and the, and it, it would, the whole process would essentially start over, correct? Correct. That would that'd be a significant change that would require a Planning Commission recommendation and then two meetings by the City Council. So we could, if, if we were to do that, we'd most likely I'd bring that up as a separate agenda item at a future meeting. And if it were the will of the city council, we would, uh, we could further study that, but we'd probably remove our current submittal to the Coastal Commission, if that was the will of the city council. Okay. Um, okay, and then since this is just an extension of the temporary, if we were to move forward with asking them to pay uh, some kind of fees to keep their temporary. If they weren't willing to do that, it would come down immediately, correct? They would come down um, May 31st. Maybe that's the end of May, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Are there questions from other council members? Uh, 
Um, seeing none, um, CD, I had a question. Um, assuming that the temporary ordinance is extended um, and the parking benches are removed, um, could you tell me a little bit more about um, what is going to be put in place for um, the safety of the park location? We were suggesting um, to require planters. Um, trying to see if we had a specific size for those, but we were in, going to require at least a minimum of five gallons planters every five feet. Uh, just a follow-up. Do you, do you have the dimensions on a five-gallon planter? And I do not. Um, I think the ones that we we utilized within our original design, and I'm I'm not 100 percent sure, but I think those are probably a two and a half gallon planter, so it would be bigger than the the planters that were utilized in the original design for that. So we'll probably double that size. And who will provide those five gallon planters every five feet? The restaurants would have to install the planters where the benches were every five feet in between the existing planters. Okay, thank you. Um, seeing no other questions on the staff report, I'm going to take this out to the public now, uh, ask if there's any members of the public that would like to um, um, communicate with council on this um, agenda item. Uh, yes, if you do, just um, raise your hand in Zoom, um, or you can dial star nine. Um, the moderator will give you three minutes to speak. You can also send an email to public comment at ci.capitola.ca.us. Um, looks like we have one attendee's hands up. Larry, if you could um, let them speak. First, first off is Peter Wilk. Yeah, hi, Peter. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, Peter, we can hear you. Okay, I just wanted to uh, weigh in with some of the planning commission comments this was something that the planning commission debated extensively everybody had their own little different comments i'm going to give you my interpretation of what i think uh we came up with which might help your decision and i hope your decision and my reason i'm bringing this up is is that you might want to do this in a, a phased response or a phased approach and say that in the temporary uh approach you're you're only going to allow it on in certain areas and there's reasons to not allow it for example on the esplanade which would be that uh, they already have a lot of oceanfront uh, views and that it's a shady area that uh, they really don't need that um, that that uh, particular area for outdoor parking and as you can see in the data it's not as well used as other areas um, in terms of uh, Monterey Avenue, the, we're talking about primarily Britannia Arms, which already has an easement of city property, their green area, and that is also a very um, utilized or very valuable pedestrian area that they're taking up as well as, as parking. Um, with regards to Capitola uh, Avenue, the thought there was there's a lot of traffic there both from a safety standpoint and from a pollution standpoint um, and from a historical notion that there historically aren't restaurants there. There, there are some now. Uh, the only, so there's, basically there's reasons to, <laughs> to uh, object to almost any location with the possible exception of San Jose Avenue, which um, his, incidentally has already been approved in the past by the city council to uh, to have parklets there or outdoor dining facilities there. So just just to, just thought I'd throw some comments in there as to as to why you may or may not want to select very specific areas for um, outdoor dining. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Peter. 
Yeah, Larry, will you um, open the mic so that, yeah, and yeah, put up the clock. Thank you. Yes, now we have Linda Smith. <laughs> okay, Larry, me. Larry, be sure to start the clock. Thank you. <laughs> I'll be quick, Sam, I promise. Um, promises, promises. <laughs> so um, thank you for letting me speak once again, Sam yeah. and uh, Council and, and Katie. Um, great job on your recommendations and on the work done so far. When the existing temporary program was extended to May 31st, it was my understanding from the council deliberations at that time that if the timetable of prototype development and approval slipped, the temporary program would be extended. I know we've talked a lot about tonight the Coastal Commission piece of it, but we also don't have a prototype that the um, applicants can, you know, can look at and see what, it's, what the costs are going to be and move forward with that. Um, I believe that having an adequate overlap between the temporary program and the installation of the long-term street dining decks is imperative to the economic success of the program. And I really appreciate staff's recommendation um, of an extension to 60 days after the Coastal Commission approval. However, once the space allocations and the basic requirements for the material and the drainage requirements and um, where they're going to be able to source the materials, even for a three-space deck, this will take some fast-footed program management with enough time to get the job done without lengthy disruption to their revenue stream. Um, planning for the worst and, and hoping for the best is the way to go in program management from what I'm looking at. And depending on how specific the material requirements of the prototype are and what kind of assistance in sourcing they're going to get, it could take a few weeks. And that's assuming that the applicants have staff to work the details and, of sourcing and scheduling. If licensed contractors are going to be required to build the thing, it could take even longer without early staging. And they can't really stage now because they don't know what they're staging for. Um, executing this effort after Memorial Day during the prime summer months, on top of the hours that these owners have been working over the last two years, is really a heavy burden. So assuming an appro approved prototype design after Memorial Day and after the Coastal Commission gets their job done, um, I would request that Council consider extending the temporary program through at least the end of September and expect installation of new construction by the end of October. And the new conditions that staff is proposing are excellent. Um, charging for and requiring available to patrons of the spaces is not only reasonable, but will enhance the program significantly. Thank you for listening to me once again. I still have 26 seconds, Sam. Use it up. <laughs> well, I'm done. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. So we now have Josh Fisher. Hey there. Hey there. Can you hear me? Yeah, Josh, we can hear you. Hi. Hello, friends. I uh, just wanted to say, first of all, thank you guys for uh, even considering continuing it. We do appreciate it, uh, uh, restaurant owners down here. Um, I think all the conditions are, in my opinion, fine. Uh, only modification I would request would be um, instead of $1.50 a square foot, which sounds a, a about like what the permanent option will be, maybe cut that in half to 75 cents a square foot until a permanent option is found. And no problem with the security deposit, no problem with the benches. Um, maybe make it four days a week instead of five um, as far as uh, required open days. And other than that, um, have no other problems with it. Would hope that it would get extended until uh, October 1st so we can finish the busy summer season finish all the festivals and all the good stuff coming and uh, go from there. And thank you. It appears you may have lost their story. Sam, are you still on? Yeah, I'm still here. Oh, excellent. Yeah. My apologies. No, 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 that's fine. I, I know I'm having issues this evening. So, um, Mary, could you let the next attendee in? 
Yeah, I don't see any attendees. Um, I do. I, I do have an email. If you'd like me, to, I can do that now. Um, I do also see that uh, Chief Daly has his hands raised, um, but I can I can read the email if or okay. have the email read if that works right well, now. Why don't you let Chief Daly speak first, okay, and then read the email? Hi, uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, I'm, tonight I'm actually speaking on behalf of the Capitol Public Safety Foundation. And so uh, the, the Capitol Public Safety Foundation, we do have our car show that's coming up June 11th and 12th. And so, um, obviously, we'll support the, you know, the council decision as with the outdoor dining, whether it stays or goes. Um, but one of the things that we wanted to reassure the council and also the car show uh, folks that are going to attend is that we'll work with the city if the outdoor dining stays, that we'll work with the restaurants to insulate the cars and put a barrier around those so we can protect those vehicles. And in the event that if they're not satisfied with that, we'd obviously refund their money. Um, but uh, the biggest issue for us, quite honestly, is just the notice of it, because if we are just, you know, our event's just right around the corner. And so uh, the notice for us is the biggest thing, so we can just the logistics of putting our car show together so we can give notice to the, to the uh, attendees and everyone. So, um, like I said, I'm kind of wearing two hats tonight, but uh, that last bit was uh, about the foundation. So thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Chief Sally. And then... Um, so, Mayor Store, we do have one email that we've received i will try what i will uh have the system read if i can try i haven't done that in a while here we go okay and, and larry will you also sign it too yes and I, so i can't share both so I, I will have a i'll have a stopwatch going if that if that is okay and i'll i will let you know or i'll stop it at, at that time so i will let's see um, where's the, re oh, read aloud. Can you see it okay still? Thoughts on outdoor dining area, Oda. We have analyzed our own data for consideration of how to proceed and looking at return on investment. We have spent over $8,700 on our Oda between furniture, decorations, and upkeep. In July 2021, 35% of our revenue came from the ODA. In April 2022, only 10% of our revenue came from the ODA when city survey was done. The city has a district tax on top of sales tax. The value of this added income to the city will help offset the loss in parking revenue. Hence the city needs to not only look at the loss of parking revenue but also the increase in sales tax dollars it has benefited since the creation of the Otis. The outdoor dining adds an ambience to the village life that if taken away leads to one less reason for guests to come to the village. The businesses suffer as well as the city from the lost tax revenue. The proposed square foot price, or $2.38 slash month per parking spot should be reduced. We propose a discounted rate at half of this full amount, $119 slash month until a more permanent solution is put into place for next season, or when Senate Bill SB 314 and Assembly Bill No. 61 expires in July 2024. Giving a larger window of ODA occupancy allows the business to budget accordingly to keep the ODAs in tip-top shape. Perhaps the new parking ad hoc committee review could slightly raise hourly rates to offset the deficit. The timetable when the survey was completed on item 9E isn't the best timing for patron flow. It's painfully obvious from your report that we don't have the number of patrons pre-pandemic visiting the village. There are still empty parking spots even on Saturdays. Noon, survey time, on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, this is when we open, patrons aren't seated yet. 6 p.m., survey time, on Sunday, this is our one day when we close early. After sunset the outdoor dining area occupancy increases. Had the survey picked up the Saturday night at 7 p.m., occupancy rates are significantly higher. Weather is an enormous factor in the enjoyment of Oda the dates picked were on the cooler side. Suggest revisiting this survey with July statistics, traditionally a busier time. Pick a weekend, like July 15th, 
16th and 17th at noon and also at 7.30 p.m., as the sun sets later and review the astounding differences. Also, it would have been a more comprehensive study to include how many parking spots were also vacant during these surveys. Regarding the design, we believe that a uniform look of the base is desirable. Safety of patrons should be a top consideration, include traffic bollards. The plan should consider how to have string lights easily installed. Mayor Story, that is three minutes. Okay. Um, let's stop reading. Um, just to be fair, that yeah, everybody gets the same amount of time um, to give input. So, um, Larry, do we have uh, any other uh, attendees? I still see uh, one hand up. Yep. Yes, we have one new hand, uh, Doug Conrad. Okay, go ahead and let Doug uh, speak. Here we go. Is that working now? Is that working now? Yeah, we can hear you, Mr. Conrad. Okay, good. I'm out here in a very cold parklet right now. Um, the, I, I want to make sure there was two other letters that were sent from uh, Reef Dog Deli and also from myself that didn't appear to make the public record that were sent to the address in Katie's email. I think those were um, sent to council. Um, also to council, but also for uh, public reading. Yeah, I don't. In, in my recollection, uh, there was okay. Then I'll take the I'll take the last of my I'll, I'll take the two minutes then real quick to just point out I have no problem with at all of. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm shivering. Um, <clears throat> I have no problem at all with a, a large deposit, five hundred thousand dollars. It, it makes that commitment uh, viable for for a business. Um, the rent right now we're still in recovery. Uh, we can't afford that. Uh, that needs to be cut in half until we come up with a final solution. Benches, uh, I have no problem. Those need to get back out there, but we need to have something to stop traffic. Uh, Five-gallon buckets is what the planters are now uh, that I built uh, for the village uh, with the four-by-four four posts in them. Those were five gallons that we picked up at Home Depot, Rodney and myself. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, just uh, So we need safety there for that, uh, lower price. Uh, and I just want to make sure I get everything that, oh, design. We've got to work on the design. Katie, you've got to work with the owners. You've got to sit down. You've got to talk to them. Um, the design that's presented has half the amount of seating as what we originally planned on. With a seat to what makes us money. Uh, we've got a landscape architect that the city hired. Uh, let's hire an architect that knows, uh, like Dennis, the design Dennis did for us before was beautiful. Redwood with copper. Uh, we had tons of seats, ADA accessible. It was safe. It had bike racks. It had planters. It was beautiful. Everybody had buy-in on it. I don't know why we're not going back that way, but that's that's the politics. I'm a business owner. I don't understand government. Um, anyway, I want to make sure you all have a copy of that letter and that you get a chance to review it. It was supposed to be public comment, as was uh, Reef Dog Delis, which was kind of sad to see. That didn't make it either. So that's all I've got. I'll submit the rest of my time to you guys. Thank you, Doug. Thank you. Mayor Story, I don't see any other people with hands raised, and I have not received any other emails um, to public comment on this item. Okay, I'm going to bring it back to council uh, now uh, for further deliberation um, and possible action. Um, and I see Council Member Bertrand. You want to uh, lead us on this? Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, first off, I appreciate the uh, public comments. And um, in terms of the survey times, um, I have to admit, I agree. Uh, it's one of the issues I had, I should have mentioned earlier. And um, I think it's very reasonable to um, come up, I believe, with a different design. I, for the, um, if we take out the chairs, uh, excuse me, the benches and they replace them with something, you know, five gallon bucket every five feet um, doesn't need me with the feeling of security. Um, maybe staff could come up with something that's a little bit better. I know there's these uh, water filled things that are plastic that we've used before um, in other circumstances. And I see them around the county. Maybe those are a little easier to use in terms of safety. 
Um, I've heard a couple of times the amount for um, the deposit um, and then the amount for the, the rental. Um, I'd be very interested to see what uh, other city council members feel on that. Um, I thought about it a little bit today and to me, the rental fee represents a buy-in for the program. You know, if, if they feel that this is a, a program that's worth their time to continue, uh, then, you know, a higher rental fee seems fine with me. Um, if their business is, is actually as good as um, they say they're claiming right now, uh, because of the uh, parklets, then the rental fee should be, I think, covered. I think also, um, as shown by the surveys that the uh, city planning did, I think uh, a better presentation of the parklets would make them more inviting. Um, when I went to the, um, uh, you know, along um, San Jose, uh, those are very well maintained. They look nice. And I think uh, the survey showed that they actually get a lot more customers. So um, maybe this is something businesses, you know, should take note of. And um, so I would be supportive of, you know, continuing in the long run uh, so that um, merchants still continue in this program, uh, remove the benches and put something else there that is uh, better for protection rather than five gallon buckets, uh, keep the fee as uh, for the rental, excuse me, as presented. And I think I heard a comment that the, um, the maintenance fee of 500 was acceptable. I, I think that's reasonable if, if the merchants um, keep up their space and, and keep it neat, et cetera, they don't even have to have anything taken from that. Um, one comment got me thinking, um, maybe cutting down the usable days to four, you know, I think uh, to some extent, it, you know, the merchants find it probably difficult to cover many days and maybe four would be better because they can choose the days that they get high traffic. I, I think that's probably one of the reasons why um, the survey shows that some days just aren't getting much use. You know, they're not going to have extra personnel when there's no people there to serve. So maybe cutting it down from five to four. Uh, those are my comments right now. Thank you, Council Member Bertrand. I'll call on uh, Council Member Brown. Thank you. Um, all right. So I think there's, you know, clearly just a, a lot of confusion between our permanent program, our temporary programs, the things that, you know, are design related aren't really on the table right now, as I understand, in terms of the permanent parklets, et cetera. And so I just want to kind of bring it back to, to what we're specifically being asked, which is about the, the, the dates of the extension, whether or not the car, um, excuse me, the park benches should stay and whether or not there should be um, a, a deposit and uh, rent for the spaces. Those are the key things that we're, we're being asked to discuss tonight, correct? Is that correct, Katie? There is one additional item with the extension date, whether or not it should apply citywide or treat the other, the ones outside the village differently. Okay, perfect. Okay, so um, I'll, I'll start with those four and then make a couple comments on uh, some of the emails that we got. Okay. Um, the extension. I, I think we should move forward with the extension. I like the idea of the two months after whenever the Coastal Commission certifies our permanent uh, to the point that was made by one of our public speakers. I think that gives a little bit of time, as we initially had hoped for, for the temporary uh, folks who uh, intend to apply for a permanent outdoor dining space to build that, um, and there's not going to be a big gap in them being able to have kind of some outdoor space. So I, I would move forward with that. I wouldn't suggest that we start dividing this up between the private property and the public property. I think right now everyone's on a temporary basis. Once the permanent program goes into effect, as you mentioned, the village folks will apply for their permanent parklet. The private property people will just come in and get some changes to their, their permit. But I think for the sake of ease and streamlining right now, everyone who has a quote unquote temporary parklet will continue to have a quote unquote temporary parklet and just leave it at that. Um, get rid of the benches, that's fine. I, you know, the responsibility for making sure that their safety um, is on those operating the, these temporary parklets, uh, be it if we put in planters or, or uh, I believe what was the, that was the discussion. Um, in terms of fees, um, 
you know, I, I don't think cutting it in half is a great idea because of the, as mentioned, the investment in this is really what's showing that people are willing to maintain, to follow the, the rules, et cetera. You know, if it's 150, I'd be willing to bring it down to like 125, um, but I wouldn't cut it all the way in half. Um, did, I, did I address all the four things, Katie? The ones, the ones that we were being asked to address, did I address all four of those before I move on? Um, the extension. Oh, and then the open for use requirement for five days. That's right, I'm okay with four. That's fine, I'm, I'm okay with four. I, I wouldn't go any less than four. Um, I think that, is, that it is important that it be open at least four days a week uh, for use. Um, and then I, I want to address some of the things that came in on public comment, both in email and, and whatnot. We heard from um, Chief Dowley as well as um, uh, Mike Termini, the president of the foundation, had sent an email indicating that, you know, they don't, they're not asking us to remove the park books for the car show, but they do need some direction and some understanding of, of what's going to be happening. So um, I think it would be important that come uh, May 15th, even though we're going, even though the people that don't pay and will take their park list down by May 31st, I think if they don't pay by May 15th when we're asking for the payment, that on that day or or in the few days after, that we can notify the Public Safety Foundation of which spaces will be available to them so that they can accordingly plan um, for their event. I know I saw um, Art and Wine on there as well, but I mean we we did Art and Wine. Um, last year and, and we had the park list up there. So I think that'll be future to future discussion. Um, what else? There was another one and I can't remember what it was now. I know that there had been, um, you know, some talk of changing some of what's in our, in our temporary. And I think that other than what we're discussing tonight and is in the staff report, our temporary should just stay as is. Um, I, I, I'm aware that there had been some concerns about um, all of those running a parklet who are in the BIA area being up to date on their, their BIA uh, dues in order to get a permit. That wasn't part of our initial requirement for the temporary, so I'm concerned about adding it now. However, if I remember correctly, it will be part of our permanent. Um, if I, if I remember correctly, because I believe I brought that up then. So once our permanent program comes, anyone who's in the BIA district who hasn't paid their BIA dues won't be able to have uh, a permit. So I understand the concern for that, but I, I'm not prepared to add it to temporary right now, only because I, I do have concerns with making a bunch of changes to our temporary program when ideally all we're doing is extending the program we already had. Um, I think that was everything I had to say. But if I think of anything else, I'll raise my hand again. And I'll call on you again. Um, Councilmember Brooke. Thank you, Mayor Story. So um, I I agree with Councilmember Brown on on her on her comments. The only thought um, additional comment I have is about the fees and. Um, and what's real realistic? We're talking about a two month extension, but with some leeway that overlaps. When I hear two months extension, if I were just looking at two months and I look at staff time and how feasible it is to get all of those people to pay fees and to collect and to and to get all that done, it sounds like a lot of staff time for two months. And I don't know if that's really worth it. Um, to, to charge for something like that, um, especially because it's temporary. Now, if we move forward with that overlap between the temporary and the permanent, and we're looking at four months or whatever that adds up to, that seems more realistic to me than to implement a um, these fees that we're, we're talking about um, until the the actual thing is built out and so forth. So I don't know if we've really thought that through. When I hear two months by May 15th, that I don't know what the end, the actual end date would would mean to that. It doesn't make sense for for us, for at least for me, to to utilize staff time in that when we've got you know meetings with Coastal Commission and and, and things like that. 
um, I'd be, so Katie, maybe that's, um, that's like a, yeah, I see your hand raised. <laughs> or your... Uh, I, I, I can explain. So it's actually, okay. um, it would be continued until the Coastal Commission certifies our ordinance, which could be in June, July, or August, and then plus two months to allow um, the outdoor dining. So this, it, it, we don't really know how long it's going to take for gotcha. us to get on the same page with Okay. So okay. That, that would be the minimum. Okay. I that would mean at ease, yeah. right? I mean, we just also want to make sure that there's a point to to the implementation of these fees and 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 purpose, right? And and I made a comment earlier about the aesthetics, and I really push that we work on the aesthetics during this temporary, and we've seen many do so, and then some not, and. Um, I think by implementing a fee structure helps kind of initiate that that and and hopefully we'll see something in the next well we would have to see something in the next six months uh, occur in terms of aesthetics because that's really important to me. Um, now, Councilmember Brown's comment though about adjusting it from 150 to 125, um, I I don't know that that kind of change really benefits, you know, I don't know what the cost savings would be for each business and how if and how um, if, how much that really would look like. Um, I'd be interested in hearing what Mayor Story who, uh, or any other council members thoughts on that. I'm not tied to it, um, but for ease, I am fine with sticking to the 150 and charging. Um, did Katie, was there any reason behind or where you came up with a dollar fifty per square foot? I think you might have said something, but was there any thought behind that? There is. Um, we looked at um, the historic use of the parking within the village and what the typical fees are that are collected, and that's how we came up with the average utilization was at $1.50 a square foot per month. So okay. it's just what we would typically take in for a parking space okay. over the course of 12 months. So it's the, okay. 30, it's the $3,400 a year that we um, rate that we put in for the permanent program just on a monthly basis. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, well then, I'm fine with keeping it at $1.50 unless the will of the council wants to reduce it. Um, but everything else, the two months after, the, all of the comments that Council Member Brown suggested, um, four days versus five days, I don't really know what that, how you would Im impose that, like how would you do that? So either way, um, again, if it's four days, that's fine, um, just for some, some leeway for the businesses. And those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Brooks. Uh, Council Member Bertrand, did you have your hand up again? Oh, yes, I did. Thank you very much. Um, so, you know, I went from five to four, and I think the way the uh, staff report was the minimum time, or day, excuse me, uh, if uh, Katie, is that true? So initially you were proposing at least five days operation. Yeah, minimum of five days, and uh, they have to be open during while while you're while the business is open. Right. So I mean, they could go five or seven days if they want, and even if we say minimum of four. So sort of up to them. Like the Brits, they're open. It seems to me all the time. <laughs> And maybe others, you know, they just don't have the business to stay open all the time. Um, the other thing in terms of timing, I think that was, uh, Yvette brought that up, uh, excuse me, Councilman uh, Brooks brought that up in terms of timing. Um, if there is a matching of timing with the uh, Coastal Commission and we're still trying to provide enough time to the merchants to have an extension, uh, you could come back to us and, and ask us for an extension, correct? If there was a set date, we can ask for an extension. Yeah, we could. Yeah. So, you know, giving the, you know, the issues with uh, all the designs and the city, uh, uh, planning, excuse me, coastal commission, 
I'm sure we could adjust that as needed. That's just my only question there. Thanks. Um, and Mayor Story, can I um, add one piece of information to the conversation? Yes. Um, I I just wanted, well, while there's so many involved restaurants on the call this evening, we do plan, we are going to be sending out an invite. I didn't want it to get confused with this hearing to all of the um, restaurants regarding the prototype dining decks. And we're gonna have a separate Zoom meeting with the restaurants for on May 11th at 10 a.m. We'll be sending out an invite tomorrow. Um, but so that step is occurring and I just want the restaurants to be aware of that. And then another email will be arriving tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification, Katie. Um, and seeing no hands from council members, um, I think I wanted to maybe uh, weigh in with my thoughts on the matter. And I would say that overall, I'm in agreement with uh, Council Member Brown's um, um, recommendation as well as Council Member Brooks um, on the particular items. But um, there is one um, item of concern that I have, and that's related to safety if we remove the benches. And to me, that's also related into the monthly fee that we charge. Um, and um, I, I would like to see something more durable or robust, or, and I'm not quite sure what that would be, but I just don't view that uh, planters or even five gallon planters are going to um, serve the interest of public safety. Um, and what I would propose or would like to see is that if we reduce the monthly fee, because we're asking, you know, the um, business owners to pay for the cost of the planters. Um, but I would like to see a reduction in the monthly fee, and hopefully then that um, saving would go to uh, providing, uh, I think, a more robust barrier uh, for the patrons um, than just planters or maybe bigger planters or, and I think, I'm, I'm confident I think the business owners and working with staff can come up with a suitable alternative uh, to the benches. Um, and, uh, and, and in order to help the owners fund those additional costs, um, I would propose that um, for the temporary rental, that the, the actual uh, monthly rent uh, be somewhere you know, in the range of 150 to 200 a month. Um, and because um, I think that one that accomplishes the goal of commitment um, and uh, surety about which uh, owners are going to be participating. Um, and um, and if you just, you know, and doing a quick calculation and to respond to Council Member Brooks about if we reduced it to just $1.25, per square foot, that's a savings of about $50. Um, and I don't know if that's significant enough to, um, I think, offset the additional expense going to safety and aesthetic. Um, so I guess those are my thoughts. Um, and the only place that I would maybe ask if we uh, if maybe lower the monthly rent at this stage um, and and, and I'm, you know, again, I'm thinking somewhere between 150 a month to 200 a month. And with that, I mean, I guess this may be time uh, to uh, see, entertain any motions if uh, a council member is willing. So if I may, before we get to a motion there are some changes that we'll need to read into the record for the resolution um so katie i don't know if you have those or if we need to do some quick polls to find out where the council is on the particular items including in the, included in the resolution i'll defer to you and the mayor and i'm here to help yeah Thank you, Samantha. Um,
So on the, maybe if we want to bring up these items uh, one at a time, I mean, one concerning the extension right. date. Right. Uh, right. And the, you know, the right. first question right. is the motion should determine um, that it applies um, throughout, you know, um, to all the parklets. Um, and it will uh, extend for um, two months following the Coastal Commission certification. I would make a motion uh, that we extend all of our temporary permits, outdoor dining permits, until two months following the Coastal Commission certifies Ordinance 1050. No second up. That, no, Sam, do we need to take each one of these as a separate motion or? The easiest way to do this would be since the resolution before the council includes the um, various uh, rules that the council is considering applying to uh, parklets that have extended permits, I think the easiest way to do it would be do it all as one resolution and we can read in any changes to the resolution that the council wishes to make. So it sounds like council member Brown, you're suggesting um, that all of the permits be extended for two months to a date, two months following certification by the coastal commission. Um, we could read that into the motion. If make it a little tricky, if you all don't agree, <laughs> on which provisions, on what to do for each provision, but we'll see how this goes. Well, if we can, okay, so, um, okay. Let's I'm trying make it, to tie it together, you see yeah. right? Yeah, so let's make that the first sentence of my motion, and if we could go to the next slide. So um, just on that point, there there's a blank in here on this, like, can you see, or um, yeah. so the date or, do you want a specific end date, maybe at the end of summer, in case our ordinance does not get certified? Do you want to relook at this at the end of summer, or just let it continue indefinitely? Um, I mean, I'll, to be quite frank, I feel like if we extend this until October and we still don't have a permanent ordinance by October, we're going to get a flood of emails and we're going to have this exact same meeting with everyone telling us, please don't extend it. You know, the, the weather is still nice and we put up tents to prevent the, I mean, we, this is what happened when we were gonna end it last October and we extended it to May, you know? And so I feel like if we even try to set a date to end it at this point, we're just gonna continue to have these meetings where people are giving us reasons why it shouldn't be ended until the permanent program is ready. So personally, I think we should just say, it's extended until two months following the Coastal Commission's certification of our ordinance, and hopefully that won't be too long, is my hope. But and, I, and I will. Yeah, and, that, and that's the language of your motion. Um, yes, yeah, so far. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, but I'll, on that particular point. That, yes. Yeah. Yes, on that particular point, my motion starts with extending all temporary permit outdoor dining permits until two months following the coastal commission certification of ordinance 1050 and next slide please all of these uh outdoor dining spaces must be open a minimum of four days a week with seating available to patrons while the businesses are open and they must remove all city benches and require a maintenance deposit of 500 dollars and and inspections and require rent of, I'm gonna say 125 for the motion per square foot due on the 15th of the month prior. And that's that's my motion for uh, for consideration or, or a starting point. I agree to the uh, additions. And so if I may suggest that it, Council Member Brown, there, are, are you suggesting that the city adopt the resolution before the council tonight with the changes that you articulated? Yes. Okay. Okay. And Council Member Betran, is that your second? Yes. Thank you. And just a clarification on the motion and pertaining to the item concerning the city benches. Um, and the, the resolution contains language about the city benches um, will 
um, be removed and instead have planters every five feet. And planters must be a minimum of five gallons. Um, so is that is the motion intended to um, match the resolution as it's currently written or some other substitute for the five gallon planters? The motion uh, as I am presenting it is to match the resolution as presented, but of course I would be willing to entertain a friendly amendment if there are any ideas uh, pertaining to a change to the, to the planters or an alternative to the planters. Well, I guess I would reiterate what I was proposing because I, I don't think here tonight we can sit and try to find a suitable alternative to the venture. Um, or knowing whether the planters are a suitable alternative. Maybe they are. Um, I don't I think we've heard any uh, qualified statements on that question. Um, so what I was proposing is that, um, that the staff and the business owners be directed to work on finding a suitable um, and safe alternative uh, to the benches. Um, and I was also proposing that the um, amount of the monthly rent be reduced to reflect that the owners are going to be incurring costs to provide that additional level of safety. Um, so that, that was you know, what I, I was recommending. Um, and um, I mean, we'll, we'll see if a council member wants to accept that as a, uh, uh, make that as an amendment to the motion on the, on the floor. Yeah, I'm willing to accept the amendment about the city benches. That's, that's fine. I apologize. I think I missed that um, mayor story. I, I had uh, in the fourth point suggested a rent of 125 rather than 150, which was a savings. I mean, as we discussed, it was only, or as you mentioned, it was about $50 a month or so. Um, and, and forgive me, I believe you had a number that you had come up with as well. Do you, are, is the 125 um, not suitable for, for what you had suggested? Oh, well, I mean, um, I, I think I, I was just rounding it and was, had stated somewhere between 150 and 200 dollars a month, um, and I'm willing. I think I could live with 200 dollars a month, which is, and I'm just, which is a like a dollar 20 um, per square foot uh, amount. Um, so if we could maybe, for the matter of getting a consensus on having the rental be 200 dollars a month. Um, okay. Yeah, I think, yeah, it looks like it's like a dollar five, a dollar seven or something. So that's, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Then let's just say uh, require a rent of two hundred dollars a month. So if those are if those are your friendly amendments, uh, Mayor Story, is to remove, or I'm sorry, rather than remove city benches, have the staff work. Um, with the business owners to determine a safe, suitable alternative, and require a rent of two hundred dollars a month. Per parking space, if are are am I understanding those to be your friendly amendments to my motion? That's correct. Okay, then yeah, I'm happy to accept those. Does the second accept those amendments? Yeah, I'll I'll go along with the amendments, but you know at this point we have no idea what the substitute would be. Um, earlier I mentioned these plastic bollards which you fill with water. I don't know what the rent is of those. Those are being used for park lifts in many places I've seen. So I'm not sure that this is going to cover it, but in general, I agree with you, Sam, that um, you know, we're, we're asking for payment of service. And you know, so for us to jump in to try to provide that service, you know, I have no problem with it. So I'll, um, I'll go along with the uh, amendment. Okay, thank you, Seconder. Um, Jamie? I said one clarification on the motion as it stands right now. Is the expectation that the city is going to be installing any of these new barriers, or is this with the motion to, to work with city staff um, to develop what appropriate barriers would be installed? Yeah. I, 
I'm sorry, go ahead, Dave. Sorry. Oh, okay. I'll just, you know, um, I mean, I think my thoughts were uh, that, um, well, I, I, you know, I, I think the city and the business owners should work in conjunction to making those parklets safe. Um, you know, I, we provided the park benches. I assume that we assisted in moving them, putting them in place. Um, and mm -hmm. so um, I think that is becomes the nature of what is agreed is the best approach. And, you know, we're going to be looking to the business owners to cover the cost of it. But if we can assist in their installation, um, I, I would think that the, yeah, the, you know, the city uh, should do that. I think it's in our interest to be an active participant in making sure that the park is safe. And so I, I know that's not a direct response, but I, I'm not sure what the recommendation is ultimately going to be. Right. Well, I, I, you know, I'm just trying to make sure I'm clear about what, what we're going to be doing as staff, because I think if, if the answer is that the city would be still installing some sort of replacement to the benches, I think we would probably change our recommendations and just keep the benches up for another summer, because coming up with another solution that the city manages uh, would be, I think, a challenge. If it's consultation with the businesses uh, where we go out there and we identify, like, appropriate planner spacing that they would then install, um, by all means, we can do that for sure. And I, I don't necessarily want to preclude if, if it's ultimately determined that the benches are the best option at this point for the temporary parklet, then I would support, um, you know, implementing that decision. Um, and um, so, those are my thoughts on that question, Jamie. Um, and um, so, hopefully, you feel you have the flexibility now. There may be some motion, need to be some clarification about the motion, because I know the motion was uh, led on that question to remove the benches. Okay, so. Mayor uh, uh, Yeah, you know, I mean, these things always get so complicated. While I would like to say, let's just leave it up to staff discretion, to your point, you know, we don't know what it's going to be. We don't know if it's going to require staff um insulation we don't know if they're just going to say leave the benches and my motion was to remove the benches so i you know my inclination is to say at this point i will either remove from my motion the requirement to remove the city benches just take that out altogether and leave them as long as the temporary program is in or to um take that out of my motion and have it become a whole other future agenda item about a discussion of what would be better than benches in a temporary program, which really seems ridiculous because this is a temporary program. So I think for this, um, you know, to try to wrap this up in a nice little bow and uh, that's become a giant knot at this point, uh, I would say let's, I will redact from my motion to remove the city benches and just leave the city benches during the rest of this temporary extension. I'll agree as a seconder. <laughs> and I can I can repeat the whole motion with all of what we've just discussed if that would make it easier for staff. Yeah. Um, well, it seems to me that we've swung the pen pendulum back all the way the other direction and. Mm -hmm. I guess I wasn't necessarily trying to do that either. Um, and um, and so I would just say, you know, um, maybe have staff and the business owners uh, consider removing the benches, um, but finding an acceptable alternative that will assure public safety. Um, and then so, you know, because if the benches stay, then my, my impetus for reducing the rent goes away. Um, so well, then we're back to my original motion. I mean, except for removing the city benches, then we'd be back to my original motion of, of leaving the rent as it is and 
requiring a maintenance deposit, open a minimum of four days, and we'll just strike the whole remove city benches part. If I may, Mayor Story, um, you know, I, I completely understand your concern for safety, right? We're removing the city benches without any direction on safety. And I, and I completely understand your concern there. Um, and, I, and I agree that we really haven't thought about that. Um, I also heard from staff that we'd love our benches back, but we don't have a solution tonight. And, and to your point of, of, you know, the planters and all of that, I just not, not to make, to tighten that knot, Council Member Brown, but what is, re, re, what is holding us back from just saying we're implementing the planters in the meantime, like saying that that's just what we're going to do, or am I missing that? If we remove the city benches, they have to put the planters in because that's what we said we're, we're going to do in our in our um, final ordinance. So can we just enforce that now? And I'm looking at staff, maybe. Is that what the expectation is? Yeah, so as proposed, the benches were going to come out and the two of the outdoor dining areas were going to be protected by the five gallon planters, um, minimum of five gallons, consistent design throughout each outdoor dining area. So we would be working with each individual person to figure out where the planter areas were going to go. That was staff's proposed fix to it. Um, okay. And, and then to Mayor Story's point, we implement that we with, and that follows in line with council member Brown's, Brown's uh, motion on the table. Um, but if there are any other things that staff can do to look at other safety precautions or anything above and beyond, Katie, in your free time, if there's any other safety things we can implement, bigger buckets, bollards, whatever it is we can do to really make it as safe as possible. Planters sound a little unsafe, um, but, you know, it sounds like a good plan for now. And I'd like to, to, to call the vote, if that's all right. Okay, we have um, a request to um, call the vote. Um, I'll, um, I'll see if any other council members would like to speak on the item. Can I just ask to hear the motion read back yes. since it got a little crazy? I was just going to say, I'd like to clarify <laughs> the motion. I. I believe where you've landed, and forgive me if I'm wrong, is these are going to be the changes in the resolution you're proposing you adopt, extending all permits, so in the village and without, not in the village, until two months after Ordinance 1050 is certified by the Coastal Commission, an open for use of four days, removing city benches, using planners, which is in the, in the resolution, requiring a $500 deposit, and then requiring rent of 150 or 125 per square foot. That I wasn't sure on. I believe it was 200 a month, right? Yes. 283. Nope. No. Nope. Doc, 200. The agreement was if we're removing the- You want to go 200. Okay, I was just reading from the, uh, the list that was provided. Yep, okay. Okay. Requiring rent of $200 a month. Thank you very much. I have that as the motion. I'll call the vote. Is that okay? Okay, great. Yes. Just, yes. Just one yes. Point. I'm sorry, yes. just one point of clarification. What we will do is we will normalize the $200 per space into a per square foot because not everybody has full spaces. Just want council to understand that. Yeah. That's fine. Okay. That's fine. Thank you. Okay, Council Member Bertrand. I agree. Council Member Brooks. Aye. Council Member Brown. Aye. Vice, excuse me, Vice Mayor Kaiser is of, of accused and Mayor Story. Aye. Thank you. Which will now, now I'm going to take us back to item um, 9D which is the temporary village parking committee goals and appointments. The recommended action is to approve the goals for the temporary village parking committee, consider applications and make appointments to the committee, including to 
three village business representatives, three city residents, one member of the Finance Advisory Committee, and two members of City Council. So, Steve, um, you want to give a cap report? Yes, I'd love to. Good evening. Once again, Mayor Council, let me share my screen quickly here. I assume that looks okay. It looks great. Thank you. So as the agenda says, the um, item for you tonight is discuss uh, two aspects of the new temporary village parking committee. Not letting me advance. Here we go. So quick background on this item. The council established the position, uh, the composition of the temporary parking village committee on March 10th. That's with three residents, three businesses, two council members and a member of the finance committee. Council also at that meeting directed uh, staff to kind of expand on the goals that were presented in the work plan at that time and bring them back for consideration at this meeting. Um, I'm going to recommend, if it's okay with you, Mr. Mayor, that we consider this item in two sections. First, we will discuss the goals, make a recommendation uh, for the goals, uh, try and act on that. And then I'm actually going to pass this off to the city clerk to deal with the appointments uh, following that. So looking at the goals, staff uh, expanded on the goals and, and enumerated them. I think we only had two goals in the, in the original work plan. Um, four goals are proposed. One is to examine the existing party, parking meter rate to determine if there should be an inflation adjustment. The second goal would be to evaluate equity between the parking permit cost and the utility for village parking. The staff report and, and some of the documents in the agenda talk about village parking lots. Um, that was an error. Uh, as we evaluated the, the report in this presentation, we rise to evaluating the utility versus parking throughout the entire village, not just in the parking. There's not just in the parking lot. Um, the sec third goal would be to examine the charges to parking program, changes to parking program rules and rates to encourage the use of the beach and village parking lots behind City Hall. And then finally, evaluate opportunities to reduce parking impacts on neighborhoods without expanding permit zones or other Coastal Commission approved permit uses. One of our big concerns here is, as we go through this, is um, taking the changes before the Coastal Commission again. Um, when we've made changes, when we expanded our parking meter areas, uh, to include the new lower lot in, in the Park Beach and Village lots, the Coastal Commission, and us, we it took several negotiations to uh, probably change our meter meter areas just to include the lower parking lot, which we built for coastal access. So we all really want to try and minimize our impacts and requests of the Coastal Commission. And in that regard, there's certain things we do not want the commission to really chime in on because that's gonna be very difficult negotiations with the Coastal Commission. That is changes in the uh, areas of the parking meter zones. We don't wanna change what we, where we have parking meters only. We do not wanna change the boundaries of our permit parking areas. Um, that'll lead to more discussions. And we do not wanna consider new areas or new permit areas, new parking meter areas and new permit areas. So this is what's in the agenda report, um, breakdown of the goals and the action items. I'm not gonna go through all the actions that the committee will get to look at. I will mention that we did remove the word lots from the second uh, goal here. I will leave this up as we start the discussion um, or I'll come back to it. Our recommended action item is to approve the goals for the temporary village parking committee, and then we'll come back with the appointments. So that's the end of my report, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Looks like nobody's raising their hand, uh, Steve. So I think I will then uh, just take this out to the public. Uh, see if any members of the public uh, 
like to speak to the council on this item? Mayor Story, I do not see anyone with their hands raised to discuss this, and we have not received any emails or phone calls. Okay. And I should just also probably say that uh, if anybody like, would like to submit an email, you can um, do so and address it to public comment at ci.capitola.ca.us. Okay. And then I'm going to bring it back to council and uh, uh, Vice Mayor Kaiser. Thank you, Mayor. I would love to make a motion um, for, to approve the goals for the Temporary Village Parking Committee. Second. Any further discussion? Why don't we go ahead and have a roll call vote um, on that question. Councilmember Bertrand. I agree. Councilmember Brooks. Aye. Councilmember Brown. Aye. Vice Mayor Kaiser. Aye. Mayor Story. Aye. The motion passes unanimously. Um, now, um, Steve, you want to uh, take us uh, to the... So, Mayor Story and Council, I will now uh, ask the city clerk to take over. I will continue running the slideshow for her, and she can talk about the appointments and the composition of the committee. Thank you so much, um, Director Justberg. Thank you. Hi, Mayor and Council. Good evening. So, we've done this a number of times for different committees, so I'll just remind you the composition for this temporary village parking committee is two members of council, one finance advisory committee appointee, uh, Anthony Rovai was recommended at a March 15th meeting of that committee, then three village business representatives and three city residents, okay? So recruitment opened in March. We did receive several applicant applications. Oh, Steve, next slide. Thank you. And their names are listed here, divided into the two different types. A suggestion would be to appoint three village business representatives, three members, um, three residents, and then decide upon the two council members or whichever order, but maybe separate those three different types of appointments out for clarity, but it's really up to council. So the applications were included in the packet. Uh, here are the names and I will take notes as to what appointments you, you desire. And again, here's a reminder of what, what it is you're looking to do. Thank you. And I can answer any questions. I, I can try. Yeah. Are there questions for Chloe? Um, Chloe, I just was curious of whether on the uh, village business representatives, did the DIA make any recommendations of, of who they would? Okay, they did not. Um, so why don't we consider the village business representative application um, and I think before we do that, since we we're, we're doing this in two segments, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and uh, take it out to the public and see if any members of the public would like to speak on this particular aspect of this agenda item. Larry, will you, uh, if you do raise your, just raise your Zoom hand, I'll dial star nine, or you can send an email to public comment um, at Capitola dot, or strike that at ci.capitola.ca.us. Mayor Story, I do not see anyone with their hands raised as attendee, and we have not received any email. Okay, I'll bring it back um, to the council. Does, uh, does anyone wish to make a motion concerning um, the village um, business representative? Mr. 
you bring the slide up again, please? <laughs> Thanks, Steve. I can make a motion if you're ready to do so, unless there's other comments. Yes, why don't you go ahead, Vice Mayor Kaiser. Sure. Um, I would love to appoint um, Anthony Guajardo from Mijos and Vicki, sorry, Guin um, and Karen Hanna, please, for the business representative. I'm in agreement with that. That sounds like a second. That is a second. Yes, okay, we got a motion and a second. Um, any further discussion by council members? Chloe, well, why don't we have a roll call vote on um, that portion of our council member um, Bertrand. agenda? I agree. Council member Brooks. Aye. Council member Brown. Aye. Vice Mayor Kaiser. Aye. Mayor Story. Aye. The motion passes unanimously. Now let's go to uh, the applicant um, for the capital resident uh, position. Uh, we have five names and we need to select three. Uh, Council Member Brown. Yeah, I'd like to make a motion to select Dennis Norton, Molly Ording, and Peter Wilk. I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion by us, council members? Seeing none, well, let's have a roll call vote on that motion. Council member Bertrand. I agree. Council member Brooks. Aye. Council member Brown. Aye. Vice Mayor Kaiser. Aye. Mayor Story. Aye, right. and that motion passes unanimously. And I think um, our last order of business is seeing if we have two council member volunteers for the committee. Correct. Um, Vice Mayor Kaiser, is you volunteering? Yeah, as long as it doesn't pose a conflict, which I think we figured out that it doesn't, um, I will volunteer to do so. Okay, great, thank you. and. And if that conflict issue should arise in the future, you know, just bring that back to us. And, cool. um, Thank you. We'll see if we can rectify it. And Council Member Bertrand, you volunteering for the committee? Yes, I am. Okay. Um, is there a motion to appoint um, Vice Mayor Kaiser and Council Member Bertrand? Um, I'll make a motion to appoint Vice Mayor Kaiser and Council Member Bertrand as our two council representatives on the committee. Second. Okay, there's, there's a motion and a second. Um, let's have a roll call vote again. Council member Bertrand. I agree. Council member Brooks. Aye. Council member Brown. Aye. Vice Mayor Kaiser. Aye. Mayor Story. And I, and that motion passes. Thank you, Vice Mayor Kaiser and Council Member Petran for volunteering. Um, and um, the Finance Committee member is um, determined by default. And so um, I believe our task on this item is complete. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Which will now, I'll bring us uh, back to item 9C which is uh, the presentation on objective standards for multifamily and mixed use residential and related upcoming proposed ordinance. Um, yes, Katie. Hi. Good evening, Mayor Story. Um, I just wanna check in, can you hear me okay? And um, moderator Laurent, is my slide showing correctly? Yes, I think you're coming across um, very clear, Katie. Very good. Okay, um, this evening I'm introducing our objective standards for multifamily and mixed use. Um, again, this is just to get you the information early for our next public meeting. 
Um, we have met on this before, back in 2021. We, there was a Planning Commission study session and then a City Council study session. Um, we've met with stakeholders twice. Um, we got initial feedback and then follow-up feedback, and we involved uh, stakeholders that are uh, involved in construction as well as affordable housing development. And this went to a Planning Commission study session on March 31st, and then the Planning Commission uh, forwarded a positive recommendation on the ordinance on April 21st. Um, the draft ordinance will um, include a new chapter for draft objective standards for multifamily and mixed use, and it also adds new references throughout the zoning code that any multifamily will have to comply with these new standards. Um, the draft, the, the new section is broken up into the sections you see on this slide. Um, most important, there's new standards for circulation and streetscapes, for parking and vehicle access, where also building placement and orientation, uh, building massing and facade and roof design. Um, so here's just an example of parking and vehicle access. Each section has an intent statement at the top, follow, um, and then the actual standards, which are very prescriptive and explain, uh, so for parking placement, it says that parking spaces may not be located and say it's in a required front or street side yard setback area or between a primary structure and a front or side street property line. Um, it sounds extremely prescriptive. I want to make it clear that there is a way if a developer cannot abide by the standards, um, there is a way in which as long as they meet the intent of the standard, the Planning Commission can approve a project. So the Planning Commission can allow deviations as long as what the developer is proposing supports the intent. So. That's what this slide was about. Just as long as it meets that intent, the Planning Commission has the ability to approve it. Um, so the recommendation and for next steps, my recommendation is that you're accepting the staff presentation. I'll be back on May 12th. Um, this ordinance, it, it sets up all of the objective standards for mixed use and multifamily. Um, and that's it. That concludes my presentation this evening. So. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Any questions this evening? Yes, Council Member Bertrand. So I, I, I like the idea of the standards, um, but what kind of process is proposed when you know a designer comes up with something that's a little bit different than the standards, but you're still trying to meet the intent? Is there a format or is this to be developed through discussion at city planning or would um, staff make recommendations because you already know the conflict? How would that yeah, be? If, if a developer came in with a project that didn't meet the standards but met the intent, we would require that the project uh, get a design permit, which would go to planning commission and planning commission would ultimately have to make that decision. Just as a reminder, this ordinance is being put in place because under um, new uh, laws that were passed, certain projects that meet a certain amount of affordability can be approved administratively. So we wanted to have more objective standards in place for those projects um, that meet those affordability standards. They would get approved by staff at a staff level, and that is why that's the purpose for this really prescriptive. And, and those projects, if the developer um, so chose not to follow the standards, rather than being reviewed by the planner, it could get bumped up with a design permit by planning commission. Okay, so this, this should um, save a lot of time from city planning and for the approval for the uh, developer. And um, they get a forewarning basically, and they can choose to be consistent with the uh, the, the guidelines and, and therefore avoid a lot of trouble and, and time. So I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, and Katie, just to clarify, um, to be eligible for these objective standards, the developer has to uh, offer 50% affordable units? 
No, so the objective standards would be applicable to all new multifamily and mixed use throughout Capitola, regardless of their affordability. Um, under certain state laws, there's uh, provisions for administrative review of affordable projects. Um, I will say though that um, they don't. SP35 does not apply in the coastal zone, so we don't. I don't think we'll see that many of them here. Um, but that they all new multifamily and mixed use residential would be reviewed under these standards. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Um, Councilmember Bertrand, did you have a follow-up? I'm awfully sorry, it didn't uh, move my hand. Okay, no, that's fine. Um, so I'm, I'm going to go out to the public um, here and see if any members of the public would like to address the council on this item. Um, if you do, um, raise your hand in Zoom or you can dial star nine. Uh, the moderator will give you three, up to three minutes to speak. You can also send an email to public comment at ci.capitola.ca.us. Larry, are you seeing anyone or seeing any emails come through? Um, Mayor Story, I do not see any attendees raising their hands to speak on this at this point, and I do not have any emails or phone calls. Okay. I'll bring it back to council. Um, you know, I don't. I don't know that we need a motion to accept the report. Uh, do you need a motion, Katie? To? I believe so. Okay. Um, yeah, Sam's shaking her head. No. Okay. So good. We we did. Does uh, any council member have any final words on this item before we move on? Well, I do. Um, without my hand raised. Uh, thank you for bringing this. Uh, to um, the city council, so Bruce, uh, and it, it is quite a bit, so I appreciate that. Okay, thank you. Um, so with that, um, that brings us to item 10, which is adjournment. I will adjourn this meeting uh, to our next regularly scheduled uh, city council meeting, which will be on May 12th, 2022 at 7 p.m. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for going through uh, a lot of difficult items this evening. Um, and I'll close by saying be kind to yourself and be kind to others. Uh, thank you, staff, and uh, good night, everyone. Goodbye. <laughs>